The water footprint of consumers in the European Union is 5,130 litres per day. Reduce. Reuse. Rethink your consumption for a more sustainable future. Take care of water. Take care of yourself. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for the Rethinking Water event, uh, live from Museu do Oriente. Uh, boa tarde a todos. Obrigado por estarem connosco esta tarde no evento Rethinking Water. Whether you are a scientist, a researcher, a policymaker, an entrepreneur, a corporate, it doesn't really matter. This event is for you. Last summer, there was a sign here in Lisbon calling on the indifferent, the resigned, and the skeptical ones to act for climate change. It said something like, we need them to save the world because we cannot do it without them anymore. Um, we need those that use the car without restrictions, those that forget about switching off the lights, the ones that take endless showers, um, the ones that buy more food than what they can eat. We need everyone to take care of the planet and its resources. Water availability is, key, is a key challenge in Europe, especially in the southern region. According to the European Environment Agency, 33% of the European population and 20% of its territory is exposed to water scarcity. And many more will be affected in the coming years as water scarcity is forecasted to increase, posing a risk to the socioeconomic development of the region. Consequently, the time to act is now. As living humans, um, everything we do has an impact, as a footprint. The water footprint of the average uh, European citizen is estimated to be 5,130 liters per day. But do you know where this number is coming from? So let's break the ice. Let's start with a small questionnaire. Please open slide.do on your phone or browser and use the code 951975. Let's start with an easy question as you all get into the platform. Where are you coming from? So let's see where this audience is joining us from, both from here at, uh, at Museu do Oriente, but also online. So we see Lisbon. Spain, Greece, you can be, uh, you can just say the country or if you want to mention an actual city as well. Okay. 
Okay, we see lots of people from Lisbon, people from Italy, Spain. So Bilbao, uh, France, Malaga, Slovenia, Belgium. So we have people from pretty much um, the entire, especially the Southern European um, region. Um, so let's move to the next one. Would you say your region suffers from water scarcity? Yes, no, or I don't know. I'm pretty sure I know where we're going with these answers. Okay, so yes is, of course, leading the way. We're at 82% now. Let's see if it goes up or if it goes down. But I'm pretty sure it will be the majority of people. Of course, as we all know, it's already a major issue. So now we come to the more challenging questions. Um, how much water would you say um, is the water footprint of a cup of coffee? So we have four options. Just pick the one you think it's the closest or the actual answer. I'll give you a bit of time to think. Because this one is a bit more difficult, I know. Has everyone answered? I see some people still making a decision. Don't worry. Do your best. Shall we reveal the right answer? Yes? Oh. Okay, so 26% of people actually nailed the answer. So according to waterfootprint.org, the water footprint of one single cup of coffee is around 130 liters of water. This includes the water needed to grow the coffee beans, but also the impact of transport, packaging, etc., on water resources. To give you an idea, it actually takes 18,900 liters of water, so the first answer, mainly rainwater, to grow one kilogram of coffee beans. Okay, now we move to a different one. And because water scarcity is not only about the quantity of available water resources, but also about its quality, I would like to ask you now, do you know how much water is polluted with the production of one plastic bottle? And yes, I know, for those who are here, I know we have plastic bottles, but, you know, it's because of COVID and um, kick will compensate their impact. So what would you say it's the right answer? These are dramatically different numbers, so this one should be a little easier. No? <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you ready for the answer? Yeah? Okay, let's go. So, according to the European Environment Agency, overall plastic packaging represents 330,000 billion liters of water polluted every year. Translating that to a single plastic bottle of one liter, this results in the contamination of three liters of water, of water resources, okay? So 71% said 330, which is way, way above. Uh, actually, 10% of people got it correct. Uh, it would be a lot scarier if the right answer was the actual <laughs> answer. So, well, thank you everyone for participating in this small quiz. Um, my name, Okay, we see the winners as well. My name is Wicca Talao, uh, and I will be the facilitator of the Rethinking Water event over the next couple of days. Um, today, tomorrow, and today and tomorrow, we are going to have several sessions on how through investment and innovation, we can build a water smart Europe, promoting the reduction, the reclamation, and the reuse of water resources. Overall, we're rethinking how we use water.
So today we will focus on policies and solutions to cope with water scarcity in Europe, while tomorrow we will have the day focusing on how can the European society be transformed through entrepreneurship, access to finance and education. You can download the full agenda with information about the speakers through the QR code you have on the screen right now, or in the back, for those who are here, in the back of your lanyards. This event is organized in the framework of the cross-sectoral activity finding innovative solutions for water scarcity in Southern Europe, the, the EIT Water Scarcity Project, together with several um, knowledge and innovation communities, so the KICS, um, from the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, the EIT, EIT Foods is leading a multi-annual and multidisciplinary uh, project designed to alleviate water scarcity in Europe's southern countries. My colleague Carmen Galindo will shortly give you an overall explanation of what we are doing and later we will have several sessions going deeper on the different actions. Um, in this event, we count with the collaboration of Feed for Reuse, Consortium. Fit for Reuse is an international project financed by the Prima Foundation with the main objective of providing safe, locally sustainable and accepted ways of water supply for the Mediterranean agricultural sector. Today we are hosting Fit for Reuse's Water Reuse Day, which will be further developed by Attilio Toscano, the Fit for Reuse project coordinator. This event aims at building bridges between the scientific community, policy makers, entrepreneurs, investment funds and citizens. Whether you are here with us in Lisbon or online, we will open some, some room for questions from the audience. So take notes and please ask them. We really hope you learn and enjoy these two days. So now I would like to invite Carmen Galindo to the stage. Carmen is a project manager at EIT Food Spain, the main organizer of this event and the coordinator of the cross-sectoral activity on water scarcity. Please, Carmen, Thank you welcome. Much. Thank you very much, Rui. And that was a super complete introduction, so I'm not <laughs> going to do it again. <laughs> So thank you, Rui, again, and, and welcome everyone to, to this event here. For those of you that are here and also for the ones online. Uh, so my name is Carmen and I'm here to talk today as short as possible to try to explain what are we doing from EIT Food uh, towards implementing a water saving economy in Europe. But before we do that, just a quick overview of what is the, uh, yeah, what is the EIT. So, the EIT is the European Institute of Innovation and Technology and is the largest innovation community. It works, we work all together to uh, transform our society. The EIT is organized in different communities, working, each of them working in, in, in major societal changes. changes. And EIT food, specifically, we work to transform the food system along working in six main focus areas. So, from alternative protein, sustainable agriculture, sustainable aquaculture. And together with our partners, we work to also, along the whole, the six main focus areas, uh, to promote the digital transformation on, on, of the food value chain. But we are here today to talk about water. It's well, and more specifically, how we can tackle water and water scarcity. It's well known that agriculture is the largest consumer of fresh water resources in Europe, more specifically 59% uh, of the fresh water withdrawals in Europe. And from EIT Food, we are committed to achieve a more sustainable agriculture and a circular food system also in what relates to the use of water resources. But agriculture is not the only uh, sector that is consuming water. So we need to think about manufacturing, we need to think uh, about energy production, we need to think also how important is water in urban planning, especially in those areas that are uh, highly, have high peaks of tourism and, and many places. So water is a vital resource in every sector and in every activity. And that's why you have in the presentation a few figures, I won't go uh, through them, but what I want to highlight is that 
uh, with water scarcity increasing, it's true that competition over water uses will increase and that will have an impact in our uh, society and in our system. So that's why we strongly believe, believe that what tackling water scarcity requires the commitment of different stakeholders and it needs a multi-sectorial and multidisciplinary approach. And that's why last year, EIT Food, together with other communities, launched uh, this project, Finding Innovative Sol Solutions for Water Scarcity in Southern Europe, uh, which we call, in short, Water Scarcity. It's a long title, so uh, if you hear about EIT Water Scarcity, we are talking about the same. Uh, and, and we work together, so in the project, we have Climate Kick, we have EIT Digital, we have EIT Food, EIT Manufacturing, Athena Research Center, Biasul and Center, involved partners that are engaged with us in the project. Some of them are represented here today with Eva, Lydia is around there, also Antonia and Rafael, so feel free to reach to any of us if you want to, to know more. But the thing is that we act together to deliver impact, to create awareness and to change our society. We do so by acting along the three areas of the knowledge triangle. So on the one hand, we support innovation by working with a group of experts, some of them here today, and the rest, m many of them are online. So if you have any question, just drop it in the chat box or talk to us later and, and, and it's, we'll try to, to, to reply. So we work to, to with them to create knowledge, to identify the challenges, to find solutions and to build the tools. We also work to transfer that knowledge, to build capabilities for industries to be able to uh, embrace the change and find solutions to consume less water resources. And finally, we also support entrepreneurs through mentoring, through access to finance, to networking. And across all these areas, we also have an horizontal activity on raising awareness, reaching the general public. Because as we mentioned before, it's not possible to change how we work and it's not possible to save the planet if we change everyone. So that's why we also do general communication activities. And all, everything we do is with the key objective of promoting a wider adoption of solutions to tackle water scarcity and to contribute to a water smart Europe. I won't go to the specifics. We will have several sessions I, afterwards, uh, but just to give you some reference. So we are building a strong network of committed experts in the water-related field. We have supported so far 46 startups and scale-ups the, since the launch of the project in 2020. We have engaged four, over 400 participants in the water academies, and we have reached over 1 million accounts uh, from the citizens through our awareness actions. And that's it for now. I hope it was short enough. Uh, feel free to reach back. And just one more message, and is that the activities from the Water Scarcity Project will be running also next year. So please stay tuned. And, and if you have any questions, feel, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmen. Thank that you. was that was short and sweet, um, and I'm I'm looking forward to to knowing more about these uh, different actions you've been doing uh, over the the past few years and and the outcomes. So um, now we're moving on, and and for that let's start by inviting uh, Eva Enyedi to stage. Eva is project manager of the EIT Climate Kick one of the partners in the Water Scarcity Project. Eva has coordinated the body of knowledge uh, experts group that produced the white paper for water scarcity, analyzing policy, governance, and technology solutions, and a mapping of financial instruments available to startups, scale-ups, and SMEs, offering solution to water scarcity. She is here to present the results of the work they have been doing this year, followed by a panel discussion with Fabio Masi and Francesco Fatone, members of the Body of Knowledge, and also Marta Lima, Executive, Direct, Executive Coordinator of the Portuguese Water Pact. Hello, Eva. How are you feeling today? Muito bem. Obrigado. <laughs> Obrigado. I'm very glad to be here today. Thank you. 
So Eva, the floor is yours for the next 15 Amazing. minutes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So I will take just a couple of minutes to, to present myself and also to give uh, promotion and visibility to the, the amazing work that our Body of Knowledge Expert Group has been doing in 2021. So as uh, Carmen mentioned, um, you can't see, I think I messed this up. I don't know. Next. Yeah, I should just use the button called next. Uh, so as Carmen uh, presented us all, we are a network of knowledge and innovation communities. That's the kick at the end of all of our uh, designations. And I work for the one called EIT Climate Kick, uh, which is focuses on, on, on tackling climate change from different angles. Um, our goal is to transform whole places and um, enable the necessary transformations in all aspects of society to uh, avoid global warming going beyond 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. And how we do this, we use system innovation as a tool and we have been working with cities, regions, national governments and whole value chains to enable them to understand the, the impact of their work and how they could enable these uh, transformations to make sure that our society will be sustainable on the long term. And uh, within this project of water scarcity, I have been working with an amazing group of 16 experts uh, this year who have been selected through uh, a, a competitive process based on their expertise, based on their uh, geographical knowledge and based on um, their um, academic uh, um, excellence as well. Uh, we have experts from all over Southern Europe, from Spain, from Italy, from Serbia, France, uh, Malta and Greece. And this group of experts have been working from spring onwards uh, through a series of online workshops where we also invited the external participants, have been working on scoping, designing and ultimately delivering to um, large scale publications which are going to be published in the coming days. These two publications um, are a white paper which is uh, focusing on policy and technology technological solutions to tackle water scarcity and another document which is uh, which we will talk about tomorrow in one of the sessions as well uh, which is a review of financial instruments available for SMEs uh, startups and scale-ups in Europe to tackle water scarcity so today uh, we will have an amazing group of uh, discussion panel for our round table so I will uh, shortly ask um, Francesco Fatone, Fabio and uh, Marta to join me in the in the stage. Thank you. Can we sit? Yes, please. <laughs> and do we un unmask? Yes. Okay. If you feel if you feel alright, we do have to mask. <laughs> yeah. And uh, while you're hey. getting comfortable, I would just say a couple of words nice about the content of the the white paper. Um, the group of experts have been reviewing what are, what are the reasons why water scarcity is still a challenge in Southern Europe. Because we all know that it's quite a visible problem. There have been a lot of uh, efforts uh, trying to tackle it, but it's still remaining and it's actually getting worse. Uh, so the group of experts have been um, looking into these reasons and in the white paper we included five reasons. Five of the biggest challenges Southern Europe faces in terms of water scarcity. The first one is water pollution, but we also talk about uh, why circular economy principles are not well applied and, and uh, widely applied yet. Um, we also looked into the different smart tools and the barriers of their application. And we also looked into why, um, the um, structural and seasonal imbalances between uh, demand and supply of water. And finally, we, we try to look at um, the governance and financial structures which are uh, not enabling water scarcity to, to be effectively uh, uh, tackled yet. The group further on went on to look into concrete solutions and in the white paper uh, you will find uh, a very succinct description of uh, weaknesses and strength of the solutions that we outline. And just to mention a couple of them, uh, we talk about water use, which uh, is also going to be uh, discussed later on today by the Fit for Use project. But we looked into control of uh, abstraction of water, also full cost recovery. So there are a number of uh, concrete solutions that we highlighted. 
and to make sure that we have a, co a, a complete uh, analysis and review of these solutions, our group has also outlined the policy enablers and barriers that need to be put into place for these solutions to, to thrive. So with that, I will uh, end my little presentation and we move on to uh, a, a roundtable discussion with our experts today. And the first question uh, we wanted to discuss with you is why do you think we have to act now on water scarcity? And I would like to ask first uh, Marta to tell a little bit about the Water Pact and the Portuguese context. Okay. So uh, good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much to EIT to give us the opportunity to explain uh, what is this uh, Portuguese Water Pact project and to give us a chance to talk in this such important uh, matter as it's the water scarcity. So th the question is related to why should we act now? Uh, the truth is, and as we've seen in, in Rui's presentation in the kickoff, and, and Carmen, and something that it's uh, well known from everyone, is that we live in a region where the water is scarce. Um, and, and the most dramatic thing is that not very far in time, almost everyone in, in the world will live in a region where water is uh, scarce. So uh, we are uh, taking, it's like a bank account, no? You're taking off more than what you can, let's say, refill uh, the, the, the natural uh, refilling of, of water resources. And of course, you're, what you're doing is that you're taking funds from the future generations. Uh, the truth is, is, if we look to some data, like from the World Resource Institute, for instance, the last study they have is that um, the entire Portuguese territory is at today it's in medium to high to extremely high uh, water stress situation um, and if nothing is done what they do have in their estimations is that uh, by 2040 the entire country and not just the southern part will be in extremely high risk of water scarcity so this is exactly why we should act now so this is direct answer to your question is that we are taking more than nature is capable to replenish and what we're doing is that we are running out of one of the most um, important uh, natural resources because we cannot live without water and we cannot replace water from anything. So water is inside us, it's, it's everywhere, sorry about that. Um, so what's the situation in Portugal? You would think, okay, you're a country in a water stress uh, situation, so um, you do many actions to prevent losing water and to take care and spend less. Well, the fact it's not really like that. Um, from the last data we have, we have per hour um, um, some water losses that account for 16 Olympic pools per hour. Uh, I will say it's 20, over 20,000 um, square meters, cubic meters, sorry, of water that is lost, but it's 16 Olympic pools per hour that you fill in and then you just pull the tab and go away. Um, and this is, you know, by problems in the water pipes. It's, uh, so it, it's just not taking care of, of what its nature is giving us, the water. Um, and then it's, it's also true that the, um, it's, it's tough for the population to, not to understand because it's not complex, but to be aware of this problem. And why is that? Because in, in this generation, um, we are lucky enough to uh, not remembering having an issue of water scarcity in Portugal. So, you know, I don't remember, my parents don't remember. We just open the water and there's the taps or in that's fresh water for everyone. So we don't have the memory of living with water problems. So that's one thing. The other thing is also the cost. The economic value of water in Portugal, it's very cheap. So if you compare in here, we have around one euro 80 cents per cubic meter of water. That's the cost. If you compare it to Denmark, for instance, which is the highest in Europe, it's above nine. But of course, then you say, okay, the, the level, the, the life level is not comparable. Okay, so let's go to Malta, for instance. And in Malta, the cubic meter of water, it's around three euros and four cents. So a lot more than the 1.8 that we pay in Portugal. So that's something that also does not help to, you know, just save something because it doesn't cost you much. And then if you go to agriculture, as Carmen was explaining, it accounts for around 60% of the water that it's spent in Portugal. The truth is, from the last study that we have from Fundação Gulbenkian, which we'll hear about tomorrow, um, is that, yes, it's true that over three quarters of farmers in Portugal already feel some water scarcity in their activities, 
But the truth is that the majority of them, they do not pay for the water that they use because they take it from pounds, from lawns. So how can you make someone invest in something that doesn't cost them anything? So how can you incentivize these people to you know, invest in, in watering systems, in, in saving water, if it's something that for them it's not really a cost because they don't pay for it? So it's, you know, it's, it's a group of situations that led to um, the, the water summit that was pro, uh, you know, uh, done by Universidad Católica Lisboa, Católica Lisbon. And, and a, a group of companies got together and discussed this water scarcity problem in Portugal. And from there, uh, the Pacto Português para a Água, so the Portuguese Water Pact, that's where it came from. So it's basically um, a group of companies, because we are uh, um, a platform of collaboration amongst companies, that say no, the time for action is now, and companies do have a lot to do and to say they can be very important uh, players um, in this uh, saving water uh, issue. So w what we do and what we have, it's a group of companies from different sectors in the country that basically are um, working in, in working groups and they are tackling the, um, the problems of efficiency in water usage, how to reuse water, and how to uh, make people aware of, of, this, of this problem. So what we're looking at is a platform where we can share best practices, share knowledge, and try and, 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 and act and do something to solve this issue and not just you know, use the excuse, oh, because the government needs to do more this or that. No, 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 we don't want excuses, we want actions, and that's, that's what we're trying to do now. Thank you, Martha. Francesco, what is your view at the European level? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I would like to start from your point, why we have to act now? Because we don't want to react tomorrow. So, uh, to go to the European level, I would like to start with a personal example. I'm coming from Italy, from Marca region, and this used to be a very water rich area. Uh, we had a, a terrible earthquake in 2016, and this water rich area became a water scarce area, basically one week. So, we, we were not ready. And if we don't act now, we will have to react tomorrow. And now it's right the moment. Why? Because in these years, uh, we are revising uh, all the main directives and regulations about water. We are revising the urban wastewater treatment directive. We are revising the drinking water directive. We are revising uh, the sewage sludge directive. Uh, all about water is under evaluation and revision. So what we will decide in this uh, two, three, four years, we stay in place for 10, 20, 30 years. So we are addressing uh, the future of our generations. And in this specific moment, uh, we are also addressing the objectives of the Green Deal. So in these specific years, uh, we have the challenges of climate change. We have the challenges of circular economy. We have the challenges of uh, leaving no one behind. Uh, and uh, only having uh, this action rapid against uh, water scarcity, we can really be prepared for tomorrow. So, at European level, uh, uh, we are contributing uh, with our innovations, with our solutions, uh, but uh, our main challenge, as it was mentioned before, is to involve the general public. To involve the general public uh, in order to get the European having water not only transversal, but central. Thank you. Fabio? I would go at planetary level more than the okay. European. <laughs> Go for it. Because my reason for acting now is uh, exactly that I look almost every week at that graph that you can find everywhere on uh, the, the internet portal, which is showing the um, planetary boundaries. And well, water is just one of them, but it's not the more red than more intense. And there are the other two, which are uh, the biogeochemical cycles which are completely disrupted already since the start of the in industrialization. And they are all strictly linked to the food production, the food consumption, and transformation in excreta, which are then somehow managed by water. And so we get a water rich of what was food, and we have to uh, really learn how to get out all the intrinsic chemical values that we have in that solution, because all the ways that we have uh, decided to manage all this cycle in the last century have brought 
to uh, bad results, let's say. So we have a, a, a lot of uh, bad uh, economical management of, of all this stuff and loss of resources. So we have been characterized by an era which was the era of the resources depletion. I mean, we were using resources without awareness. Now, the awareness has grown up a lot. And this could give us the good chance to put in practice what, from a technological point of view, is ready already since a lot of years. So we just need to put the intention and to put in practice what we almost already know how to do. Uh, obviously, there are uh, still weaknesses that we uh, need to, to fulfill, to, to improve. So the research is still a, a big part to do, a big play. But uh, that's the moment in which the transition to the new era, which is the era of the resources conservation, has to take place. Thank you very much for all of you. The next question relates to one of the, the big topics which is coming up in, in European policy and also it is included in the, the Portuguese water pack which is the application of circle economy principles. How do you think a circle economy can help tackle water scarcity? And I would like uh, Francesco maybe to, you to start. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this was one of the challenges that we have been addressing in our white paper and actually I'm very glad to start this discussion because I'm also responsible for circular water in water Europe and in the International Water Association. So I brought all my global and European experience in our white paper. Well, circular economy is not only water reuse, it's also water reuse, but is being circular by design. We had a very nice uh, uh, introduction about the water footprint of products, how much we are circular in the design of our products and uh, how much we are able to think about uh, the efficiency together with the, the recovery and reuse. So that is the challenge uh, that uh, we have highlighted. And uh, finally, we have to keep the natural capital as a main objective uh, of our activity. Because uh, with nature based solution, together and in combination with gray solution, when we have for example, no space, uh, or we have to manage high risks, uh, this can be the right approach to have the resilience and the circular economy. So, circular economy is much bigger. Now, what is the point at the moment? At the European level, the current uh, circular economy action plan uh, has a section on water where uh, water is addressed for nutrient management, is addressed for water use, is addressed for uh, the revision of sewage sludge directive, uh, but actually, again, water is too limited, probably. We are not taking advantage of the huge amount of research and innovation within Horizon 2020 that was carried out. So we think that we need uh, actions that are facilitating uh, by regulation, by innovation-based regulation, the application of our results. Otherwise, circular economy cannot be in place because we need these innovative solutions to be more spread and to exit from the niche market. Marta, I, I know that we have this discussion about circular economy in the water pact and you work with uh, private companies who are really eager to, to take action. Do you have any good examples that you could mention? Yes, it, it's absolutely in line with uh, what Fabio was just mentioning because um, I'll, I'll just give two examples of two of the companies that are in the pact. Um, and I'll start with L'Oréal, which is, I believe, someone... Uh, the, the something or a company that everyone knows. So um, I'll give some examples of what they're doing regarding the circular economy uh, in, in, their, um, in their working process. And, and as Fabio was mentioning, I mean, it starts from the beginning. It starts from redesigning uh, the, the formulas of the product. So uh, they have several projects in hand. And what they're doing is that they're rethinking and relooking at all the product formulas from the shampoos to, you know, you just name it, and see how can they optimize the water usage efficiency. Okay, so to s basically to spend the less water possible. And this starts with, with the product formulas. Then it also goes to the packaging. Okay, so they're, again, rethinking all their packaging. They have a program with their... Um, packaging suppliers also and see and, and, and incentivize them to share uh, their um, water um, their water usage uh, metrics so not just from their side but also upscaling 
to you know the the, the beginning yeah. of the process and with their suppliers um, and they're also thinking not just in more efficient packaging but also in um, refillable uh, bottles for instance so you can use it more than once not just use it and throw it away use it more than once and then just go to the supermarket and refill your shampoo bottle for instance um, and then even in the water usage itself, uh, they also uh, not just try to spend less, but they reuse the water that they use in the factory. So they reuse it to uh, cleaning uh, machinery parts, for instance. They reuse the grey waters to cool uh, the systems down. Um, and, and they have this project which is called the Waterloo Factories. They have now 17 of these factories. Um, where their aim is to go to, a, let's call it net zero water usage. So in the end, what they want to do is that they can inf recycle in an infinite way the water that it's used by the factory, so they do not take any more water out of the nature system. So this is one of the examples from, from L'Oréal. Um, then I can give another one, which is Superboc Group, which is a brewery group, the biggest one in, in Portugal and one of the biggest in Europe. And, and going back to the coffee example, uh, to produce one liter of beer, you need three liters of, of water. And just in the production system. So I'm not talking about you know, growing the beans and the transportation, so just for that. And the three liters, it's actually one of the best ratings in Europe, which is the ones that they have in Superboc. Why? Because they also try to minimize um, the, the, the amount of water that they use. And then they also reuse the water again to clean the machineries, to, to cool the, the factories down. Then they, they clean the waters, the, the gray waters to starting by cleaning the bottles and then finally they clean the water, the, the crates of the beer. So again, what these companies are, are thinking in is not just, okay, use as less water as possible, but also redesign all the production cycles, the packagings and the products itself so that they can use the less water possible and then reuse the gray waters that they're producing and with this try to have uh, better circular um, uh, processes to, to optimize this, the usage of, of this scarce resource. It sounds really exciting. It sounds really positive and really smooth and straightforward. But I would ask, uh, were there specific barriers they had to overcome to achieve this? Well, if it's for internal use, it's, it's easier because uh, in a way you're not, um, I mean, it's not used for, it's not drinking water, okay? So it's to clean machinery and all of that. So the regulation, it's not so strict and it's easier to use. Then if you want to reuse water uh, and use it um, for uh, human consumption or even to, um, you can irrigate a field. If it's for food, then you have already some very strict regulations and in that it can be tougher. But this, I, th I believe there are good examples of things, again, that can be done without the excuse of, no, I cannot do this because, you know, the law does not, uh, it's not possible. No, 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 there's so many things that companies can do and are doing and that's what we want to share. Hey, of course there are barriers and of course there are things that are you know, being revised and, and are undergoing into, into the change for the future. But there are already so many things that can be done um, and companies are actually doing it. Thank you, Marta. Fabio, would you like to add something? Uh, I, I could give uh, some examples of uh, application of circular economy in the water sector and uh, one is uh, one of the case studies that we presented in the white paper which is one of the European uh, projects that Francesco was mentioning, the Horizons, and uh, uh, the project is Hydrousa and there we, why we have considered that case study in our white paper just because uh, in uh, the first slides we were saying that, seeing that uh, uh, the highest uh, consumer of water everywhere in the world is agriculture, so it's the food production. And uh, it's 60, 70 percent almost everywhere. And uh, therefore it's exactly the first target that you have to hit. It's where you have to concentrate your efforts more, let's say. And uh, in this project, we are just testing uh, one of the first realizations worldwide where we are irrigating uh, uh, growths, let's say, so uh, like an orchard, by uh, treated wastewater. And that's already applied in uh, some other situations. Let's say in Italy, we have some other case studies too, also in bigger scale. Um, one particular um, addition in this experiment is that we treat the water in a very sustainable way 
and we use nature-based solutions, which are coupled with some uh, other technological uh, compartments. Uh, and this is uh, somehow uh, lowering down the maintenance cost of the system and making the effluent uh, available at an affordable price. Because one of the main barriers that we are uh, facing, uh, at least uh, in Italy, we, we, we have this issue all the time, is that when uh, you have to treat the wastewater to a certain level for them being reused, the treatment cost is most of the time, let's say 99% of the times, much higher in comparison to what you pay from the top. And so, uh, for instance, at urban level, uh, that's the second example I wanted to give. Uh, we are investing a lot in my company in uh, uh, designing nowadays green walls for uh, treating and recycling grey water. Why grey water? Because it's the 70% of the water, con of the domestic water consumption. So it's the biggest amount of water which is coming out from, your, from every single house. This grey water is much less polluted in comparison to the one where the excreta are mixed. Mm -hmm. And it's much easier and even less expensive to treat it at those levels to be uh, then reused. The problem is that who has to invest in this? The family which is living in the apartment. And you have to convince them to make the investment. Mm -hmm. And even though installing a green wall for the few we know yet because it's, uh, we are uh, at a starting phase of the implementation of this te technology, but for the few we know now, for a family it could be a cost of uh, 2,000, 3,000 euro. And the 3,000 euro of water bills are several years. No? And uh, so you have to convince the family, okay, you have inv to invest uh, this money and you will get some uh, effect in terms mm -hmm. of payback just after seven or ten years. And that's the main issue. I mean, it's not so easy to convince them. And that's why we should need or facilitations by somehow some incentives from the politics or uh, 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 a more right price of the water, let's say, to follow the, the technical price instead of the political price, uh, wherever. Very interesting. In, in the discussion, a couple of um, uh, users came up, uh, the citizens, the industry. Uh, what do you think, how, how do they differ in, in their interest and also the the, the acceptance or rejection of some kind of circular economy principles? Well, for uh, the direct experience, normally with the industry is uh, just a uh, direct thing. I mean, you discuss, uh, the, you make a feasibility study and you understand if it is economically feasible or not technically and economically feasible mm -hmm. to implement something for recycling water in that industry. In a lot of cases it is, and uh, even though the, the, sometimes the industry is uh, paying the water even less in comparison to the domestic users, um, still it can be convenient if they consume a lot of water, like uh, for cooling uh, for uh, mm -hmm. some big amounts, thousands of cubic meters per year, then it can be uh, convenient and it's evident by uh, a first study. For uh, the uh, private users, let's say the citizens, that's something different. I mean, uh, you have before to rise up the awareness, why they have to consume less water, why they should adopt the recycling uh, approaches and so on. And we are still in that phase, I think, yeah. that we have to create to f uh, this formation phase, the cultural phase. And then there is the economical one. I mean, and that's exactly what I was uh, meaning before. If the investment cost is very high and the payback is very long, uh, for the moment there are difficulties. So uh, we need other kind of mechanism in order to make the application wider. Now I would say for, for the companies, there's also two other factors that are apart from the, the what just Fabio mentioned, the, the, the financials of the project is that First, it's the, um, how they fund themselves, because obviously, uh, you know, companies need to show more and more that they are green to get the money out of the market. So that's something that it's helping the cause, let's say so. And then also the consumers, because the consumers are more and more aware of all the, the climate issues that uh, we are facing. Uh, and so they're more and more demanding uh, on, on the company's way of working and how they produce their products and how what, what they do. Um, and so there's two 
positive things, let's say, that are helping us, not, not just the water, but I mean, climate action in general in the companies. And, and sometimes even if, uh, you know, the, the payback, it's not so obviously um, directly, um, they, they are forced by external, let's say, external uh, actions and forces to do something and to do better than that what they're just doing. So that's, that's a positive thing. Yeah, I, I would like to complement what Martha was saying because uh, nowadays more and more companies, well, mainly large but not only, are uh, approaching the science-based target for uh, the climate ambitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this context, uh, they are putting uh, action plans. It's not only marketing. It's not blah, blah, blah. Is actually action plans uh, that is uh, approaching the water issue from the nexus point of view. So water, energy, food, ecosystem, and climate. And uh, with this in mind, we are working with the multinational companies in the chemical industry, in the agro industry, in the pharmaceutical industry. And they know that it's not physical, economically feasible, financially feasible. Or, uh, and, but thanks to this uh, new approach, and thanks also to the EU taxonomy, it has just been uh, structured, well, it's the first uh, approach that we are having at European level. Uh, if we want to, they want to go to the green finance, they have to demonstrate that uh, finance is not the only value that they can get from uh, um, addressing water scarcity. So again, I think that the climate ambitions are really changing uh, the paradigm. And now more and more, we see cases. Many of them are big companies. We have to address the small companies. How the small companies can really have uh, advantages from the climate ambitions? Because for the large companies, we have the measures, I think. Thank you. That was a really interesting discussion about circular economy. Uh, the other topic I wanted to discuss, which has also been highlighted as a means of um, uh, tackling climate change, uh, are nature-based solutions. And I wanted to introduce this topic into the discussion about how do you believe nature-based solutions can help tackling water scarcity. Flavio, yes, would you mind starting? Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, I strongly believe in nature-based solutions. I work on them since uh, all my life, uh, 20 and more years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, wh what they are, essentially. So first, the definition. Nature-based solutions are just a tentative or reproduction of natural processes, which are naturally happening in nature, by engineering. So we are trying to design something, some to put together in reactors, let's say, uh, processes which are normally taking place in, in nature. Uh, for doing that, we are even trying to not add uh, elements. I mean, uh, in a normal wastewater treatment plant, for instance, you, you are still using nature, you are using bacteria, but you are forcing them to go much faster than what they used to do in nature, just adding energy to the system. And you add energy, pumping uh, air inside, uh, steering, and so on. We, in, in the nature-based solution, you leave the nature doing its things in uh, its time, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so it needs m more volumes, uh, which are normally uh, needed for the treatment in comparison to the energy-needing techniques. And uh, uh, so they have a higher footprint on the territory, let's say, but from the other side, they are green. I mean, nature-based solutions means that I'm trying to reproduce something which is very similar to nature. So it has all the components, which are soil, water, and plants. And exactly the reproduction of these kind of green infrastructures, that's another way to, to call them, could help a lot of uh, creating a lot of uh, side benefits more than uh, the first one, which could be, I don't know, um, protect from flooding uh, an area of the city or to purify the water to a certain level for recycling it. That could be the main aim, but uh, what the what's the, the more interesting thing is that when I realize one of these reactors, I'm also able to forecast uh, a lot of other side benefits, which could be, for instance, uh, uh, local climate mitigation. If you have a heat peak in the city, then uh, you can create a lot of uh, green infrastructures, green walls and so on, giving water from where you have it, and so better to use uh, already used water for, the, for irrigating these systems, for instance, instead of getting tap water. And um, 
Uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, just obtaining uh, all uh, these side effects which are uh, value at the end. I mean, if I put a green wall on a, uh, on a building, I'm creating also insulation, which is meaning that I will need less energy in summer uh, for cooling, less energy in winter for heating. And that's a side benefit, no? Um, if uh, that 70% uh, of the water of the building doesn't go to the sewer, that's a value because uh, those uh, cubic meters will not reach the ending point of the sewer system, which is a wastewater treatment plant. And the best industrialized wastewater treatment plant nowadays in Europe is about, uh, has a cost per cubic meter of about 30 cents for, for the treatment, I would say, a very well set up uh, uh, big wastewater treatment plant. And so if you think to millions of cubic meters per year, which are consumed in a nation, these uh, zero three per cubic meter are still millions that could be saved if you send less water to the final treatment point. And so those are all side benefits and we are learning how to calculate them and to give them a precise value because that could make more interesting their application even in, in, a, in a economic terms and not only in the environmental ones. Thank you. Marta, uh do you have examples from the Water Pact about nature-based solutions? Yes, so um, I'll just bring uh, two of the companies that are in the pact. One is Sovena, which is a food uh, company, and the other one is Singente, which I guess a lot of you also know. Um, and so the two of them, Sovena is the owner of the biggest uh, olive oil groove in the world. They have, uh, it, it's in Portugal, uh, they have uh, 7,000 acres of, of olives planted. And, and of this uh, territory, this farming territory, um, what is good to know is that 30% of the, the, the full amount of space, let's call it like that, is dedicated uh, to natural meadows. So what they've done is that um, between the olive trees, they've just planted um, natural uh, local plants that help increase biodiversity in, in, the, the, in the, the farming uh, spaces. So obviously they have more insects, they have more bees, um, they have a better uh, quality of the soil, so it means um, they have more moisture in the soil, which means they need less water to irrigate the plants. Um, they have more fertile soil, uh, which does not degradate and the erosion of the soil, uh, it's not happening um, as it was in the past. And so, um, apart from bringing more biodiversity, they are also using, uh, as Fabio was mentioning, um, like parallel, um, let's call it activities, for instance, with higher number of bees that they have, they've contacted a local honey producer, so now he has honeycombs in the olive uh, spaces, and they're producing local um, uh, honey, which is then sold. Um, and, and they just, you know, they give away the, the, the money to uh, refund some projects in the local spaces. So it's, it's uh, again, it's working with, the, with nature and uh, it's helping also the, the, the community. And then there's a second example, again, with this uh, Superboc group that I mentioned in the beers. They also produce work. Um, and so they're, um, they are taking care of a, a natural park in the north of the country, and this is why I think it's interesting, because the northern part of Portugal, it's still not yet in a very critical situation in terms of water, but they're already working to improve the situation. So what they're doing is that uh, they are planting over 2,000 trees, uh, so they're going from 20 acres to 26 uh, acres of, of uh, natural forest. Um, and what they're doing that uh, because um, they're, uh, they can see the results also in terms of their production. So what does it mean? It means that obviously with um, better quality in the soils, with the trees, what they're seeing is that the water that they're capturing, it's better quality and uh, it's actually uh, more abundant in some, in some of the data that they're collecting. So they're just not taking care of the nature. They also have an interesting program with the local community because they're increasing jobs in that part of the region to take care of the forest and you know with all the project of the reforestation. So they're doing better for nature, but they're also doing better for their business because they're getting better water quality and higher um, quantity of the water. So it, it's again, it's a good case study because it's also improving uh, their, their economical benefits as a company. So that's, that's very good. 
Thank you, Marta. Francesco, I wanted to bring in uh, some critical views from your side about nature-based solutions because it all sounds amazing and it all sounds a very easy decision to go for nature-based solutions, but what could be the drawbacks or the limitations? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I, I, I really think that we don't have a solution. We have always a combination of solutions. And uh, actually, I don't want to put uh, the best solution only on the cost because today, we have technological solution in which uh, plants are energy positive. We have technological solution in which we can recover materials, we can recover energy. And uh, so the plants are becoming, uh, uh, refineries are, are becoming fabric of products and these are not nature based. In, the, in Denmark, we have a, a new tender that is out that is going to recover 150% of the energy that is used. And well, the cost is not what Fabio mentioned. So. This is the direction that we are uh, having uh, in these industrialized plants. So there is no solution, there is a combination of solution, especially if we address the problem from the risk management point of view. Now we have uh, the new regulation in place, last year was published. Uh, at the moment, the GRC is working uh, um, on the European guidelines uh, for uh, water use uh, uh, risk management plan. Actually, we are also working in fit for use about that, we were contributing to the GRC work. And uh, uh, risk management will need uh, solutions that are fit for purpose. In our catchment, uh, we have uh, industrial discharges, sometimes we have illegal discharges that we don't know. And uh, I agree, nature-based solutions are highly resilient, uh, can be very cost-effective in some cases, but how they are reacting to illegal discharges? Are we sure that they are able to minimize the risk are we sure that they are able to keep the class A reuse that we need? So, uh, in terms of multi-barrier, I'm promoting uh, a combination solution. Nature-based, when needed, for smaller design system, most probably they are very effective. For large and centralized, most probably we need a combination of centralized, very effective from the carbon footprint, energy footprint point of view, and as refinement, nature-based, to increase the resiliency because uh, the nature-based solution is also a, an equalization that will allow different reuses when uh, uh, these are needed. So reuse of water is a continuous source of water to be reused, and with the nature-based tertiary step, uh, we will uh, increase uh, the potential of our new fabric of resources. Thank you. Can I add? Of course. <laughs> He's provocating and, and I replying. That's why I asked him the question. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, uh, th there is a real different uh, vision in between the two words. I mean, the business as usual, which is the centralization. Uh, so you have sewer systems which are bringing to a final uh, treatment. And instead, the vision of uh, wh which I, I completely understand is something that will not happen tomorrow. It will need time. It will be a transition what I'm talking about. So we will not do that tomorrow and with the current directive. We need an ad, a new directive. And uh, how to deal with this risk? Segregating. Segregating and uh, operating closed loop, which is meaning I want to work really at apartment level. Because from there, I'm sure that will never be an illegal discharge. I mean, we, you could have the crazy guy trashing uh, 10 bottles of sulfidric acid for uh, declogging uh, the sink, but uh, that's all. I mean, uh, and it will kill every kind of system, technological, non-technological. Yeah? Uh, but if you segregate a lot, so if you go to the decentralization, which is exactly the opposite uh, uh, direction that has been followed in the last uh, decades, let's say, where we have pointed a lot in the centralization of the treatment, if you go instead to the decentralization, you are much more able to control any kind of uh, risk management and risk assessment because you are knowing the sources. And you are recycling closed loop, which is uh, uh, saving energy at the end because you don't have to move the water from one side to the other of the city. So if we will be able to implement systems which will operate at block level instead of a city level, let's say, so one quarter only, and each quarter will have his uh, struvite plant uh, producing the fertilizer, its uh, cellulose uh, recycling, uh, its water, uh, new water uh, recycling, and so on. 
that probably have much less issues with risk management and the legal uh, practices, which can be a weak point. I perfectly agree with you. That could be, that could be an issue, but I'm also convinced that the, the decentralization could just play right uh, for, for dealing with this kind of issue. But, but I think it's also true that uh, governments can, can play an important role here. For instance, I'll, and I'm not a legal specialist, but for instance, in Portugal, if you build a new house, you need to have solar panels. Mm -hmm. But you don't need to have, because you're obliged by law, but you don't need to have any type of water treatment or even of rainwater captation. And I think this is, I mean, it's not very difficult to change because you just need to put it in the law as the, 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 the solar panels have been introduced in the law. So I believe that, and then I guess uh, maybe Francesco can be the right person to talk about this because I think then it's, it's the problem of how can you, in a way, uh, un make uniform or, or, or similar laws within European Union, which is very complicated because, again, countries in the north in Europe are much more advanced than us in the south in terms of all of these regulations for the construction. But I believe that some things are not so complicated uh, to, to implement and will be you know, very easy and, and fast and could make a total difference. For instance, in Lisbon, 95% uh, of the water that comes from rain goes directly to the Tagus River, so to the sea, 95%. And, and, and it's a shame because we don't have enough water. Um, which can even lead us to a geopolitical geopolit situation in a way that can be complicated because 50% of our water comes from Spain. So in 2040, when the, the World Resource Institute tells us that if nothing is done, we will be in an extremely critical water shortage situation, how can we ask and how will Spain be able to give us 50% of the water that we consume? Because they will be in shortage as well. So. It's very complicated, and I believe that you know governments and, and regulation can do big things and, and, and not so complicated things and make a difference as well. Thank you. Yeah, I must have the last word anyway. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, it's not balanced. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> yes, again, I think again that uh, combined solution and uh, fit for purpose are the ones that we have to address. Uh, Thinking into account the existing asset, okay, and uh, further to this, uh, um, I'm also thinking that when we think about highly decentralized solutions uh, that uh, have been discussed and studied over the last 40 years, maybe we have to think about the public perception. Eva, are you going to operate your own wastewater system at your house? Are you going to put your hands in in place? Are you sure that uh, your kids? will be able to understand that everything is fine. Well, we have a lot of TV shows about that, but are we sure that the public is ready for that? Mm. So uh, we are going in one direction. You know, usually I'm the visionary in this talk. Today I'm the bad cop. Yeah. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> but yes, I, 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 think, I don't think that we have a solution. We have a combination of solutions that we have to study case by case. Thank you. So we have a couple of minutes for, for the public to have the, the last word and ask some questions to, to our panel. So I would like to ask the, um, the people who are present in this room if they had any questions to the panel or to any particular person. Gaitan.
So before you answer the question, I would like to just summarize it for the, the viewers online who might not have heard perfectly what Gaetan asked. Uh, the question is around how to scale up solutions that have been um, presented or approved on a small scale. Um, well, you can start, please. Not, uh, we, we, it's exactly the kind of job we, we do in my company. We are developing techniques. Mm -hmm. And the way we do is uh, we start from the lab uh, pilots and we publish peer-reviewed papers. Then we go to the medium scale or full scale installations. We still do the monitoring. And so we obtain data and we make uh, peer-reviewed uh, papers out of it, which can be used then as a reference literator by other practitioners and designers that can use our results for uh, uh, making their design. So that's the normal way we do in, in the sector, let's say. So we designers are looking for references, normally it's scientific references. So someone which is telling us how to do the thing no? and having uh, uh, the proof that it was done already and it was working. Because when we sign a project, we are guaranteeing that for 25 years, 30 years, the system will work as you promised. No? And so for having this kind of uh, safety, let's say, uh, we base on uh, scientific references. So the, the way up to me is just to go that way to produce a good scientific background to the technology. I would say in terms of the companies, um, they can do this in two different ways. One, it's uh, one of the ways that we try to uh, implement in the water pack is that they share best practices amongst each other. Um, not amongst, not only amongst the, the, the members of the water pack, but even in the social media and share with other companies, uh, because it's yeah, not so we're a small group and just want to keep the information for ourselves. No, no, the idea is to share um, with as many companies as possible and, and uh, emphasize the, the good results and what can be done in new solutions. And then these this big corporations, uh, they also have a very important role in, in what Francesco was mentioning before, is that with the small companies, uh, for instance, L'Oréal, I'll give the example of L'Oréal again, they're uh, financing um, some very interesting projects in terms of innovation. One of them, for instance, is a company that it's developing uh, something, and I'm sorry, I cannot tell you what that something is, but for instance, if you go to the hairdresser to wash your hair, it takes around eight liters of water. And L'Oréal, it's one of the big um, suppliers of, of uh, hair care products. And so they're developing something that allows a technology that allows you uh, to, in the tabs of the, the hairdressers to reduce these eight liters to one or 1.5 liters of water to wash your hair. So this is really big and it can have a huge impact. And L'Oréal is financing this type of innovation. And what they're also doing, as many other of the big companies, is that with their small suppliers, you know, they're, they're incentivizing, they're some, many times they're just financing new projects or they're showing better things um, to be done in, in the upstream of their uh, supply chain and even in, in the downstream when, when it's in terms of, of um, distributing the product. So what they're doing is that sharing with their peers what they're doing and how can be done and also with the supply chain, the whole supply chain, helping and supporting, you know, maybe smaller companies that, you know, gravitate around their activities and with that incentivize uh, the, the better, better results and better practices. Yeah, as, as a final comment, I think we should consider the, the specific type of water user, agriculture, industry and uh, urban public. Um, for the industry, I completely share this uh, mechanism is uh, actually working already. And if we couple it with the climate ambitions, it's working pretty well, and even more in the future, probably. When we think about uh, public water use, uh, well, actually, yesterday I was with the European Water Regulators at the European Forum of Water Regulators, and this was actually the point. Uh, probably the regulation can be the real driver. Because uh, if we have an innovation-based regulation that uh, will uh, uh, give incentive for the front runner and uh, will not uh, stop this uh, innovation for being applied more and more, um, this will be not uh, applied by operators that are uh, really doing their business as usual. For agriculture, most probably, well, uh, we have to think uh, about the chain of food, EIT food. That's a real challenge because it's more complex, most probably. Mm -hmm. so, in, in the public service, we have uh, the regulatory framework. In the industry, we have, well, business that can be more or less sustainable. 
for agriculture is probably more complex and that's where I see the, this innovation uh, to be really uh, driven by the public perception about the food that we are consuming. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the whole panel. Uh, there is a question, I guess. Yes, I'm Mario Carlos from Sinafi. I just wanted to mention that, that there hasn't been any discussion of the social aspects uh, that are involved in putting into place um, these types of innovations. Uh, I'll just give you an example. On the Mediterranean coast, uh, the Turkish government made available um, uh, rainwater collectors for any village that wanted them. And they had no traction for two or three years until they realized that the person who had to validate the use of these collectors was the village elder. So once they convinced the 85-year-old, 90-year-old village elder to put uh, a, rain, a rainwater collection system in his house, everybody else put them in. So it's not just having the innovation. There's a social aspect that has to be taken into account if you're going to make this work and on any innovation. So just to summarize your intervention for the viewers online, uh, it's about the social aspect of innovation and its uptake, that it's very important to, to make sure that we understand how an innovation will be used and who is making decisions about the use and who can influence the end users to uptake that. And we had a really good example about uh, uh, water collection in, in Turkey. Uh, which have been distributed but not used by the, the users for a long time because um, they didn't have the backing of the, the village elder. I think it's a, it's a really good point to, to end our discussion that uh, uh, we have very good scientific uh, uh, and academic people on the ground and also with, with our group of experts we have been looking into the different ways innovation could, could help tackle water scarcity but we are a long way still to tackle this challenge, but uh, I'm very confident that with these kind of discussions we are getting closer by the day. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Eva. Thank you, Fabio, Marta, and Francesco. Just to let you know that the body of knowledge uh, activities will, will also run uh, next year with new challenges. So um, there will be uh, a call for experts. So just stay, stay tuned for that. Um, and well, now it's time for um, a coffee break. Uh, for those of you at home, we'll be back in about 30 minutes. So let's say at 3.15 Portuguese time, um, 4.15 if you are in Central European time, or 5.15 if you're uh, joining us from Eastern Europe. For the ones here, we are having um, a coffee on the fifth floor. You can follow the signs and the hostess at the entrance will um, just guide you to the, to the coffee room. We'll be back here at 3.15, as I said, to continue with the Rethinking Water journey. Thank you, see you in a bit.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, for those of you at home, I hope you had some time to, to rest and to get ready for, for the next uh, sessions. Um, I personally have enjoyed meeting in person some of the people doing exceptional work in, in this sector. And, and for now, I wanted to go back to slide.do. So we're going to go um, back to asking this time a very simple question. I promise it will be easy. Uh, well, I don't promise. I'm just teasing you. Um, so please open slide.do again uh, on your phone or browser and use the code 95119, sorry, 75. Um, so the question for you is, would you eat a salad grown with wastewater? Um, <laughs> so I'll give you a few seconds to answer. Um, I'm seeing many yeses coming in, a few no's as well. Of course, some people really uh, convicted about it. Not sure, uh, maybe. So I would say that the general direction is towards yes, at least in this audience, but there are people with some doubts uh, some people that really need probably some time and some more information to to consider this. Uh, but well, our co <laughs> let's bring them here. <laughs> so our collaborator uh, Evgenia uh, did a survey not so long time ago on LinkedIn, and out of 190 responses, 71% of the people declare they would definitely eat a salad irrigated with treated waste water. Um, I guess that kind of compares to what we're seeing here as a, as a general trend. So um, now it's time to open the water reuse day section framed within the fit for reuse project. The following sessions will go deeper on the potential of reusing reclaimed water and other non-conventional water sources in agriculture. The Fit for Reuse project aims at finding and promoting the use of safe, sustainable and local non-conventional water resources in the agriculture sector, which today is responsible, as we, we have heard already, for uh, near 59% of total water use in Europe. I would now like to invite Atilio Toscano to join us on stage. Atilio is full professor and vice director of the Department of Agricultural and Food Sciences at the University of Bologna. His main focus areas are irrigation, water management in agriculture, nature-based solutions for wastewater treatment and reuse. He is currently coordinating the Prima Fit for Reuse project, so he's in fact the best person to conduct the following sessions within the Water Reuse Day. Atilio, welcome on stage. How are you feeling today? Thank you, Rui. I'm quite well. It's a pleasure for me to be here in, La in Lisbon to join the Resinking Water event and to be able to start with the Fit for Reuse second Water Reuse Day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will leave you in charge now. Yes, thank you. And see you in a bit. So, good morning to everyone. Already presented by, by Rui. I would like uh, at the beginning of this session to start with a short presentation of my Fit for Reuse project, of our my Fit for Reuse project, that is uh, a project funded by Prima Foundation. It is, it is addressed on wastewater reuse in agriculture. So, Water Reuse Day. What, it is, what is Water Reuse Day? Is uh, our main event within the project. We have planned three of these events. The first was done last year. The second is this one, together with 80 Food. I would like to thank 80 Food and Water Scarcity Program for this opportunity. And the third will be next year at the, the f as a final event of the entire project. And of course, this is a way to engage as much as we can stakeholders on this topic. The project objective starts from uh, three concepts, food needs, water requir requirement to produce foods, and climate change. These three important statements conduce us to the use of non-conventional water resources as alternative 
or as a way to fight against climate change. So the main objective of the Fit for Reuse is to provide safe, locally sustainable and accepted ways of water supply in the Mediterranean, not only European, but the Mediterranean agricultural sector by using non-conventional water resources. That for us means treated wastewater as well as desalted water. The Fit for Reuse Consortium is uh, made of uh, nine partners from seven countries in the Mediterranean. And we have uh, partners from France, like Ecofile, an SME. In Spain, Biazul, partner also of AT Food. Uh, in Tunis, in Tunisia, in Tunis, the University of Tunis El Manar. In Italy, we have three partners, the University of Bologna, my institution, that is the coordination institution of the Fit for Use project, but also the Polytechnic University of Marche, where Francesco Fatone is working, and the National Institute for Environmental Protection and Research of the Italian government. Then we have a partner in Greece, the National Technical University of Greece, and a partner in Israel, Mekorot, the biggest national company of, uh, for water supply, sewage treatment, and so on. And finally, we have a partner in Turkey, Itunova, an SME starting from the uh, Technical University of Istanbul. Uh, main points of the project, seven partners, nine work packages, 16 pilot systems, three-year duration and uh, a budget of about two, two million euros, which is the concept of the project. The project is uh, organized within three main pillars. The first pillar is devoted to treatment solution, to develop treatment solution for treating uh, wastewater for reuse, of course, in agriculture or for recharging groundwater and also for treat uh, marine saline water and also brine recovery. The ambition of the first pillar of Fit for, of fit for Reuse is to combine solution, combine intensive innovative solution with natural based solution. Is a little bit like the discussion uh, of the previous round table. So we have solution that has to be combined, fit for uh, the purpose specific case by case. And this is their mission. The second pillar is, is devoted to the application of the non-conventional water for irrigation, for example, or for aquifer recharge. And the third pillar is addressed to increase the social acceptance of non-conventional water use in the agricultural sector. So this means uh, the engagement of stakeholders, the capacity building, uh, but also uh, we will address this topic with uh, an holistic approach by means of uh, LSEA, economic LCC, social LCA, and cost benefit analysis. We will see better in the next section today. Most important project outcomes by now. We have pilot plants installed and operating. The project in the, is in the second year. We have developed, we are developing a simulation platform. We are performing irrigation tests. We are developing a methodology for a water reuse safety risk management plan for the resources, non-conventional resources to be used in agriculture. We have developed a multi-stakeholder, multi-level platform to engage stakeholders, uh, and of course, the organization of this Water Reuse Day. Just a few points before starting with the main presentation of this day. Our pilot plant, you can see here some nice pictures. We have pilot plant, as I said before, on natural-based solution, for example, in Italy. We have intensive pilot plant for desalination improvement in Israel, but we also have integrated the pilot plant combining natural-based solution and intensive solution in Italy. We have bioelectrified wetlands in Greece, 
photobioreactor in Israel and the desalination pilot unit in Tunisia. But you will see better in the next section. The simulation platform was developed within Fit for Reuse uh, with the aim to have an easy tool to simulate the functioning and the operating of this solution developed within the project and also the combination within, uh, with this different solution. The irrigation test is the second pillar. We will apply this treated and non-conventional resources directly to, to test and to verify and to validate the effects of this unconventional water into the field. And you can see here uh, nice pictures about the pilot system we have built in Italy. Then, water use safety risk management plan is a methodology well connected and linked with the European new regulation that was developed. It was the main uh, products, the main topic of the first water use day last year. And then uh, you will see also today in detail our multi-stakeholder platform. That is a tool to engage all of you, all the stakeholders. And then the water reuse day that is the event of today. And uh, I say again, next year we are planning to organize a final event, the final conference of the project, hopefully in a physical, in a physical way uh, we will see where for closing the, the project and to have our last meeting and event. Here you can see finally our motto, Reuse to Reduce, and also our social media, our website. So I thank all of you and uh, I invite all of you to follow our project. Thanks. So it's time now for our uh, main main speaker and as I said before Fit for Use is founded, is financed by the Prima Foundation and so we have here with us uh, uh, Dr. Antonella Autino that should be connected. Antonella is the project manager at the Prima Foundation. Antonella, thank you for being here. We don't hear you, just a moment. Here. Maybe you have try Antonella, try to speak. Yes, yes, yes. yes. perfectly. Okay, perfect. That's thank you, okay. thank you, Antonella. Thank you. Please, yes. please, the floor, is, the floor is yours. It's yours. Yes, thank you very much, Attilio. Hello to everyone again. I'm uh, Antonella, the manager of the Prima program, speaking from Barcelona at the Prima uh, Secretariat headquarters. So first of all, I wish to thank the speakers of the previous session for their presentation and discussion held during the round table, which we were, were really inspiring, I must say. Um, allow me to thank uh, the organizer for inviting Prima to this joint event organized by IT Food, the Water Scarcity Project and Fit for Use, which is, uh, uh, as Atelier uh, told uh, you uh, a few minutes ago, the Prima project selected out of its uh, first schools. Uh, so thanks uh, to Attilio Toscana and Ms. Galindo and all the organizers for this interesting opportunity. Uh, it is clear that Prima and IT Food share some of their priorities, especially uh, the vision toward uh, more food system transformation toward climate resilient uh, Euro Mediterranean region. And the transition toward uh, sustainability, and especially having more sustainable land and water management, uh, is essential to preserve our planet. And here, innovation is key uh, to achieve it. Today's event tackles a topic of increasing importance, considering that many times uh, we take for granted the importance of water that is a precious resource on which our society thrive and on which ecosystem depends. But in several parts of the world, water is instead really misused. And the Prima programs grounds the strategic research and innovation agenda on the need to increase the sustainability of water resources in the Mediterranean region. 
which is undoubtedly one of the most vulnerable areas in the world to climate change, as well as one of the most impacted by human water demand. Just to, to give some figure that probably you know uh, quite well, in the Med, more than 118 million people are affected by water poverty and an additional 60 million face water stress to some degree. And this is specifically true uh, in the southern shore of the Mediterranean. So in this context, there is urgent need to rethink the way we use water and natural resources in general. Let me say uh, that I particularly appreciated the title of the joint event uh, for that. So how can we do that? We need to seek solutions that are more sustainable, for example, with reduced environmental impact while uh, looking more closely to the interlinkage among water ecosystem, food and energy. In fact, interconnection among water and food are clear. Water scarcity has several implications for food security and sustainability of the agricultural system in the, in the region. That is really what Prima is aiming at, so to consider the interconnection among the sectors, breaking the silos, which is the only way uh, to achieve sustainability uh, of the resources. Moreover, we need to find ways to use less water to produce some more food, which represents a significant challenge, of, of course, that uh, in this context, the valorization of non-conventional water resources becomes imperative to increase water availability to a circular approach. This requires that we look both at the technical and policy option, as well as regulation governance issue, to find ways to promote the water reuse and address all relevant concerns society, industry, and regulator may have. As I said, well, the WFA nexus, the water, uh, energy, food, and ecosystem nexus, and the use of non-conventional water resources in agriculture are the core of the Prima strategic research and innovation and agenda, and they're being addressed by several Prima projects. We uh, really hope that through this project, we can help Europe as well as uh, its neighbors to identify the right solution to address water scarcity related issue uh, jointly. On this project, uh, one of these projects is uh, Fit for Use, which is, uh, as Atilio introduced, a, a transnational project whose output will have for sure a critical impact in the region in terms of promoting water use in agriculture. This project is advancing very well. Uh, it has reached its midterm re uh, re re review and uh, with success. Uh, pilot plans for domestic wastewater treatment, uh, water desalination right treatment have been installed uh, and they are uh, operational in a different part of the region. And we expect that these technologies will enable wider use of treat water, wastewater and desalinated water in the region to provide safe, sustainable and accepted ways of water supply breaking down possible legal or conceptual barriers which might hinder their adoption. Uh, I conclude here by saying that I really look forward to listening to the next presentation and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much Antonella for being here and for your speech. So, I would like to introduce, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, that is with Dr. Faisal Cenini. Faisal is a, a senior water expert at FAO, and uh, he is also a member of Fit for Use External Advisory Board. Faisal, good morning. It's a really a great pleasure to have you here, and I'm very glad you will share with us your experience at FAO level about non-conventional water resources. Thank you again. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angelino. Uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, good morning. I don't know uh, 
for everybody. Uh, I'm really very pleased to uh, to be with you today and uh, to take part of uh, the fit for uh, reuse water reuse day and within the framework of a very nice uh, um, uh, nomination of this the event the, the repenting water event is really innovative so I am really very, very pleased to present to you. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, a success story for FAO. It's a, uh, the initiative for non-commercial water. It's for the Maghreb region, for the five countries: uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, and uh, Mauritania. Uh, the initiative, uh, the name of this uh, initiative is Imenco. So I will uh, quickly present uh, the, the framework of this, this, this initiative, the, the vision that uh, uh, we followed, the holistic approach, the innovative, innovative approach also, and the objectives, the component and the structure of this uh, Imenko initiative. And uh, uh, it was mainly uh, uh, adopted by the Maghreb policy dialogue, which is very important uh, approach that we followed, and uh, we have organized this uh, this policy dialogue, and it was really uh, an important success to adopt this uh, initiative. And finally, I will quickly talk about uh, what after we have prepared the subregional investment plan. Uh, uh, especially to implement this uh, initiative. So this is the uh, so the, the framework of the, this initiative. Uh, you know, we work in this this sub region, the Maghreb region. So we have uh, our partner, the Arab Maghreb Union, as uh, uh, main uh, partner. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, the FAO regional initiative on water scarcity. And a special project uh, fo fo focusing on uh, the potential of uh, some uh, non commercial uh, uh, water as uh, treated wastewater and drainage water. Uh, the vision, uh, it, it was this vision we started with, and now we have uh, all the five countries they adopted this uh, vision. And uh, this vision is saying that non commercial water is at the heart of integrated water resource management as a sustainable alternative to improve water and food security in the Maghreb countries. So this is the adopted uh, vision. Uh, the holistic uh, and the innovative approach, uh, we started by the, the state of the art, by several studies uh, in these uh, countries, and we launched it. This is very important. A national policy dialogue in these countries and to, to understand and how to innovate because the rate of reuse is, is so low. We, we know what happened, we know the state of the art, but we, we don't uh, have any means how to, um, how to improve this rate of reuse. So the, the idea is and the that we uh, identified with the partners at these countries, two pilot sites, one for uh, treated wastewater and one for uh, drainage water. And we used the cost-benefit analysis for these pilot sites. Uh, we developed a, a, a webinar series, guidelines, policy briefs, etc. And as I said, we organized it uh, uh, Maghreb Ministerial Policy Dialogue. Uh, during this policy dialogue, FAO and uh, the Arab Maghreb Union, we presented this initiative to the ministerial uh, meeting, and all the countries they adopted this initiative. Uh, so, what after? Well, as I said, we prepared this uh, sub-regional. Uh, um, investment plan, which is a document, project document that we are now uh, looking for uh, findings. 
so as I said, we started by different uh, reports, each country with three reports, one for treated wastewater, the state of the art and the perspective and for the drainage water. And uh, we applied the cost benefit analysis to identify which option for these pilot sites. Uh, because uh, the, you will see after that that uh, these pilot sites are really the innovation and uh, what we want to do with these pilot sites to have them as sites of excellency. So what is needed for these countries to see a success projects on the reuse of treated wastewater and drainage water. Uh, this is the location of the, the pilot sites that we, our partners, they selected for their countries. For each country, we have two pilot sites. Uh, this is the national, uh, the national dialogue to understand the state of the art and the perspectives. And this was very important to take a decision and to be, to have this ownership of uh, this uh, vision and uh, all the strategic orientation. Uh, as I said, we, uh, it was very important to launch a, a, a huge program for capacity development. For us, for this subregion, to, uh, the, the, the objective is to improve the cooperation and collaboration between the, 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 the different countries. Uh, so we used this uh, uh, this uh, capacity development for high level uh, stakeholders, for technician, for engineer, and also we developed some guidelines for the end users. Uh, what is the initiative? What are the objectives of this initiative? The Imenco initiative. The uh, first uh, objective is to improve the political and institutional and legal framework for the management of non-commercial water uh, in the context, as uh, we, the visions uh, said, that it's at the heart of the integrated water resources management. Second, the objective is to strengthen planning project procedures and regulation and uh, to focus mainly on the problem of uh, pricing and tarification, and also the technology aspects and the available uh, tools and how to uh, improve uh, the, to develop the capacity uh, of uh, the decision makers and for the technician, for the engineer, and also for the end users. Uh, the, the MENCO initiative is also looking to um, introduce a new water culture based on the awareness because now here in these countries there is a problem of acceptance and there is a problem of social problems also related to the reuse. So this new uh, culture will improve and to, to make these uh, uh, mainly the end users uh, to, to, to improve the awareness uh, for the end users and also the, the high level uh, stakeholders. Uh, the, the, last, uh, the last objective is to develop the, the capacity of, uh, of the, 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 the partners that they are involving in the reuse uh, uh, field and to develop uh, the, the dissemination and uh, exchange of knowledge and, uh, and best uh, practices. What are the components of uh, this initiative? Uh, the, the, the first pillar, it was uh, permanent to establish a permanent technical committee that will be uh, in the uh, Secretariat of the Arab Maghreb area. And this was already done last week, and all the countries they uh, adopted uh, and they they uh, agreed to establish this permanent technical committee for non-commercial water for the Maghreb uh, uh, region. Uh, 
And the, the second uh, component is, I thought uh, about the pilot sites. Uh, we are planning to have these uh, pilot sites of uh, excellence. And uh, we, we, these pilot sites will focus, um, will include the, the collect, uh, the treatment, and the reuse. So all the chain, this is to improve the reuse and to, to show that we can succeed uh, to have a, a success a project um, to, to show that we can have uh, really uh, a project that we can uh, have uh, really the excellence from the collect till the reuse. And we are planning the, the, the third uh, component is to have this collaborative uh, uh, platform for exchanging and uh, information. And there is also uh, the establishment of Maghreb Research and Innovation Center. All this will be will uh, cons will uh, constitute the Maghreb Hall of Excellence for non commercial water. And all these components. Uh, all the, the, the five Maghreb countries, they adopt and uh, now they have this initiative, it's, uh, uh, the ownership is there. This is uh, quickly the, the structure of this, uh, this Maghreb Pole of uh, Excellence for uh, Non-Conventional Water. We are planning to connect all these uh, pilot sites, drainage water and uh, uh, treated wastewater to national research center at each country and all these five uh, uh, national platforms will be connected and to have this uh, this uh, sub-regional Maghreb uh, uh, platform. This is uh, quickly what uh, I want to share with you and uh, as I said, uh, one of the success that uh, really we, said we have it when we implemented when we organized the policy dialogue and the, the five countries they adopt this initiative and they agreed how to improve collaboration between all these uh, uh, countries and as i said what after we prepared already now uh, this uh, sub-regional investment plan how to implement all these components of the initiative the pilot sites from the collect, treatment, and uh, the reuse, and how to have this uh, regional platform, etc. Uh, so this is an idea about our uh, initiative. And thank you very much. I hope that I was on time. Yes, thanks a lot. Thank, thank you very much, Faisal. That was a very interesting initiative and interesting presentation. Thanks again for your work. It's, it's a pleasure to understand and to know what is happening also in the other side of the Mediterranean. And this is the focus of the Fit for Reuse project that is addressed to that area. So we go uh, deeper into the project Fit for Reuse and we will start to present some of the solutions that are been um, uh, that are ongoing now with the fit for use so uh, so i introduce francesco fatone that you already know because he's participated francesco the microphone francesco uh, lose the microphone but now he's here with us <laughs> so francesco will concentrate uh, on solution for domestic wastewater treatment and uh, Please, Francesco, try to be on time when you want. <laughs> and Stevo told me that I will have 9.30, minute 30 seconds. Now Not 10. No, 9, okay. <laughs> but well, as you can understand uh, from the previous panel, I will uh, present how combination of solutions can be the solution. So, Fabio, sorry, <laughs> I have 10 minutes more. <laughs> this is a surprise for you. So, I think the presentation should be on. Yes. Well, as uh, Attilio was uh, mentioning, uh, in Fit for Use, uh, we are uh, uh, aiming at fit for purpose 
solutions in different areas of the Mediterranean basin. In fact, uh, our aim is to test in real environment uh, intensive or compact solutions, let's call them compact, uh, uh, in combination with nature-based solutions for centralized and decentralized systems in order to deliver wastewater that is uh, treated in the most sustainable way from the footprint that we are measuring, environmental footprint, social footprint, but also in terms of uh, uh, risk management. Sorry. It was better before, maybe. Probably <laughs> yes, <laughs> not for the audio. Right. So, this is the approach. At the moment, uh, well, uh, our conventional plants usually they have only the primary and secondary treatment. Uh, disinfection is uh, more and more not using uh, uh, chloride, but is using a uh, uh, parasitic QB anyway. Advanced oxygen processes sometimes, and we are able to reach reuse with these uh, advanced processes. Our approach is to integrate existing asset, integrate the existing paradigm by this combination, inten intensive plus nature based, in order to achieve uh, reuse according to the current regulation that is currently in place. This was published last year, and uh, this will be in place for many years now. So, uh, where to put nature-based solution before the intensive, after the intensive. Of course, this uh, uh, will depend on the quality of wastewater to be treated. Uh, that's why we have the platform uh, that uh, is going to simulate uh, the actual uh, efficiency of the treatment schemes uh, in order to have uh, uh, local solutions uh, for uh, local uses. Here you can see some examples. Uh, uh, this is uh, an um, anaerobic uh, treatment that is coupled uh, with membrane technology. Why? If we want to achieve a fertigation in uh, class A of the current regulation, we have to achieve very low limit of pathogens that cannot be achieved with uh, uh, non-intensive uh, uh, disinfection. And we have to achieve a high removal of COD and we have to keep the nutrients. So here you see the scheme where the primary treatment is also able to divert the carbon source to recover biogas, to recover energy, uh, in order to optimize again the energy footprint of the system. So in such a case, uh, we are going to deliver water for fertigation, but we are going to address also the emerging contaminants. Emerging contaminants, not only in terms of pharmaceuticals, uh, but also in terms uh, of uh, toxin compounds. We have uh, also studied here the fate of microplastics. Well, but better to call them microparticles, because we have investigated the microfibers and microplastics. And here you can see the result that we got so far. Uh, another scheme that uh, we are testing, still staying on anaerobic treatment, that is uh, our solution when uh, we are working with uh, uh, wastewater from concentrated streams, so from uh, separated sewers, for example, or for decentralized systems. In this case, this plant is uh, applied in Tunisia. This is not coupled with membrane, but even in this case, uh, we are combining uh, anaerobic, possibly with that option, to address both conventional and non-conventional contaminants removal. What is the challenge here? Is to get to a retention time that is uh, very low in order to have uh, a system that is as compact as possible. And the challenge here is also to have uh, uh, an anaerobic system that can work at a lower temperature than 20 degrees, that can work at 15, 16 degrees. This, this is the challenge. Bear in mind that also utilities that are currently operating in UK, that is not a Mediterranean country where the temperature is much lower than Mediterranean countries, are adopting, uh, for example, this pernal anaerobic system. So we are aligned with the current trend of innovation around Europe. Of course, uh, we are addressing uh, non-conventional uh, pollutants, not only from uh, nanotechnologies, uh, molecular printing polymers, but also this is what CMOS uh, and the National Techn Technical University of Athens is doing. Uh, we are uh, testing uh, nano-zero violent iron uh, uh, resins uh, uh, that are actually demonstrating uh, 
very good efficiency in the removal of pharmaceuticals. Of course, we are addressing the targeted pharmaceuticals and also good efficiencies of removal of uh, um, heavy metals. So this combination can address uh, what has to be studied according to the last regulation case by case because uh, the regulation is not telling us the number of compounds to be studied but according to the local conditions we have to focus on specific compounds. What about nature based? In this case uh, the leader of the world package is uh, our coordinator at University of Bologna and here we see some uh, different pilots that have been tested. This is the, this is the plant of uh, uh, Granarolo that uh, as you can see can be tested in different configurations uh, and here horizontal flow and vertical flow that this can be combined and these have been tested for long term in order to demonstrate as you can see not only the um, organic carbon removal but also the efficient terms of nutrients and, uh, and E. coli that you can see here. This is the Greek pilot in Greece that was uh, uh, quickly presented by Attilio before. In this case uh, the challenge is to combine uh, uh, natural processes uh, with uh, bioelectrochemistry that again uh, is working well and here you can see the removal of uh, COD more than 80 percent uh, and in terms of nutrient what we can get out of that is again a water that can be used for fertigation. Bear in mind that below 2000 population equivalent uh, we can use water with high level of nitrogen and phosphorus for fertigation. Above this limit we have to comply with of course the urban wastewater treatment directive. When we move uh, about nature-based solution in Tunisia, this is uh, a picture from uh, the uh, pilot plant that is installed there that can be coupled with an urban treatment before. And even in this case, uh, the uh, approach was to have different solutions uh, uh, that can be uh, operated under different conditions in order to test with different uh, uh, influent concentrations uh, the efficiency and to find the best scheme for different sites in uh, uh, South Mediterranean countries. What about the integration? Well, so all these are tested uh, singularly, some of them are already combined, but uh, the challenge is uh, to have uh, one demonstration in one site. And this is the pilot tool that is currently in place in Imola, close to Bologna. Uh, where uh, our uh, uh, colleague Stevo is uh, passing a lot of hours to set up all these uh, uh, incredible uh, sequence of operation where we have uh, an anaerobic reactor that can be coupled or with membrane or with tertiary filtration, avoiding membrane, in order to save energy and to work uh, uh, actually any way to achieve uh, the limit for use or in case uh, fertigation is not allowed because fertigation can be allowed in some periods of the year not in other periods of the year nature-based solution can be used as a, a nutrient management system in order to achieve the maximum flexibility from the system this is uh, also going to be combined with uh, other solutions to increase uh, the removal of uh, uh, non-conventional contaminants such as the molecular imprinting polymers and the nanozero-violent uh, iron and of course uh, a disinfection when the class A of the uh, reuse is targeted uh, is, uh, is in place. Here you can see some of the results of course this was very challenging to start up because of the um, size of the plant but uh, now everything uh, is uh, running properly and we are testing the optimal conditions. We have integration of plants uh, and uh, we are not addressing uh, only wastewater but we are addressing also other water sources and this is uh, uh, the case uh, of integration in Tunisia where anaerobic and uh, natural based solution have been combined. Even in this case this infection is more or less needed depending on the quality that we want to achieve for the fit for purpose reuse. So again combination is the key. And uh, here you can see how pot tests uh, in a small or larger scale have been tested have been carried out. And this is the case uh, of Lesbos. Uh, in this case, uh, again, you can see a combination uh, that is addressing the removal uh, via bioelectrified wetland, uh, sand filter, of course, before uh, the linozervalent iron, uh, again, to remove uh, organic carbon, address nutrient, and address uh, uh, non-conventional contaminants, pharmaceuticals and metals, and disinfection. So, what about uh, 
the combination, what about the risk? This is how the system uh, should be managed by the water use risk manager. According to the new regulation, uh, we will have a, a person, a, a, a company, an operator that is responsible to manage the risk of the treated wastewater in the full value chain, starting from the beginning of the treatment plant up to the field and the final water and food users. So, in this case, uh, the planning of risk management is crucial. This is where the European Commission is working at the moment, even with our support, we are contributing to the work of GRC. And uh, we are addressing uh, the different risks, uh, the different uh, uh, barriers, uh, and uh, being inspired from the European work, we are going to consider what can be the issues that are also in Southern Mediterranean. And the final aim is to get a preliminary guideline that can be working not only in European countries, but also in Southern Mediterranean, not to have uh, guidelines for the Mediterranean basin. In particular, we are following a semi-quantitative approach and a quantitative approach uh, because uh, in some cases monitoring can be highly expensive and not uh, affordable by very small system because risk management means monitoring. And if you don't have uh, enough uh, scale for monitoring, uh, you cannot manage the risk. So that, that, we, that is another very important point to be considered. As you can see here, these are uh, uh, this is the algorithm, basically, for uh, uh, starting from uh, quantitative microbial risk assessment up to the human health target. So this is, uh, of course, uh, the uh, health risk assessment that is highly challenging. And uh, here you can see uh, the quantitative chemical risk assessment and the way we are uh, proceeding, of course, uh, following the guidelines of the World Health Organization. That's it. I think I was a bit longer, but hopefully clear. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. You gave a lot of work to the cameraman because you worked up and down a lot. So it's OK. We will continue with the solution for desalination and brine treatment. So should be connected online, Sivan Blake. Sivan is Water Treatment and Supply Department Manager at Mekorot, and uh, he will present this solution, this part of solution from Work Package 4 of the Fit for Reuse project. Sivan, are you there? Just a moment, we don't hear you. Try to speak. Can you hear me? Yes, please, Ivan. Thank you. Please. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Not yet. You have to share your presentation from the platform, please. I don't know if we have the presentation inside. Sivan, if you prefer, we can present from here and you say when we have to move the next slide. Uh, okay. Okay, a few seconds. We are searching for your presentation, a few seconds, and I will move for you. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, 
You see the presentation, Sivan? I have to wait, wait a minute. I can share it. One moment. I don't know if uh, he, he is able to see also the presentation or not. We are presenting in Lisbon, he's talking from Israel uh, and uh, online in presence. We are testing several solutions also. Can you see my the, presentation? For the engagement. No. Can you see my presentation? No, Sivan, not yet. Please, Ivan, we, we can uh, have your presentation here and you can start talking and uh, give me, tell me first slide, second slide, because uh, we will be I, able I to... Don't, I don't see the presentation. If we can charge here the presentation right now, yeah, we have. as before. Okay, Sivan, we are seeing your presentation also online. They are seeing the, the presentation. Yes. So, if you have your own presentation, you see now? Sivan, do you okay, see? Okay, so I, I, will, I will tell you when to. Yes, I see now. Okay, okay so today. tell me when you want to. I change slide. Please go on. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I, I apologize for the delay. Um, nice to meet you. My name is Sivan Bleich from uh, Mekorot, Israel National Water Company. Um, I will present today the desalination and brine treatment uh, activities within the consortium, work package four. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so uh, we have uh, four main pilots in the uh, consortium. Uh, and we are focusing on two themes, uh, energy and brine. Why energy and brine? Energy is the biggest uh, operation cost in the salination process and one of the bottlenecks to uh, implement it more widely. Uh, brine, the brine issue is also a big bottleneck, mainly in inland uh, facilities. Uh, so we have uh, two uh, pilots focused more, the first two are more focused on the uh, energy uh, reduction and the, the, the pilot C and pilot D are more focused on uh, brine management. Um, the first one in Tunisia, pilot A, um, is uh, utilizing a, a combination of, of membranes, nanofiltration and uh, reverse osmosis in order to reduce the energy consumption. And in addition, uh, we are utilizing uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, technology to, to uh, minimize the, the consumption even more. Um, the second pilot in, uh, in uh, Israel is also aiming to reduce the energy, but using other technologies. Over, over here in Israel, we are trying to minimize the differential pressure or uh, fouling over the membranes that also causes uh, higher uh, operat operational uh, cost due to the higher pressure caused increase over time. Uh, we are using the FRD. FRD stands for fouling uh, reduction device, which is using uh, electromagnetical uh, waves to reduce the fouling. And we are using uh, different cartridges, uh, innovative cartridges, the pretreatment, in order once more to reduce the fouling. Pilot C and Pilot D are more focused on the brine. Pilot C is a photobioreactor using algaes to remove nitrates from the brine and to enable 
discharge into the ocean without any environmental impact. Pilot D, uh, last but not least, uh, is uh, trying to harvest minerals from the brine and making, uh, making uh, some kind of a circular economy uh, impl implementation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, let's dive into the four uh, pilots and see some of the preliminary results. Uh, this is the, the features of the first pilot. Uh, you can see uh, it is four inch uh, uh, membranes. Those membranes are utilized many times for pilots. They are not the same diameter as the full scale uh, diameter and I will uh, address this issue later on. Uh, in this case, we are using uh, different uh, concentrations of, uh, of salinity to simulate different uh, brackish water. Brackish water could come in a range of salinities and uh, the team in Tunisia are, are, are testing different uh, salinities. And the objectives one more, once more is to reduce the energy and also to utilize the brine as a source for irrigation of certain crops. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now you can see the uh, you can see how the pilot uh, looks like uh, from uh, theory to to reality. You can see the uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, facilities and the membranes in the four-inch uh, pressure vessel. You can see the stream. This is what has been. Uh, uh, built by the guys in Tunisia so far. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, preliminary results that we have from this pilot. On red, you can see uh, the NF alone, the nanofiltration alone, which is more open membranes. On, on orange, the, you can see the RO, and green is the, combina the combination, the hybrid configuration, which uh, so far looks uh, better in terms of uh, recovery rate and the retention of the salts. And we are just having discussion with the, with the guys in Tunisia uh, of how to uh, implement or how to extrapolate those results into a full uh, configuration of eight inch membranes with uh, the full uh, stages, which is a bit different from the pilot in four inch uh, configuration. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, the second uh, pilot also focused on energy is in Israel. Uh, we, are, we are utilizing different technologies to reduce the fouling, to reduce the increase of the delta P or differential pressure in order to once more reduce the energy, which is the biggest operation, operational cost in the salination. Um, we have here, I guess, the biggest pilot in the consortium in terms of uh, flow, uh, the RO uh, pilot, as you can see the flow over there. Um, and we are also testing different technologies for pretreatment, different cartridges. Um, next, next slide, please. Here you can see how those uh, pilots look like. Uh, on the left, the skid for the cartridges for the pretreatment with the simulation of a four inch uh, membranes, once again, smaller than the commercial. On the right uh, side, you can see the RO uh, pilot. Here we have the eight inch uh, commercial uh, membranes with the FRD, the fouling reduction device to test uh, its uh, influence on the differential pressure increase over time. Next slide, please. Okay, here we have some uh, results from the fouling reduction device uh, testing. Uh, as you can see on the left uh, uh, graph, um, the, the comparison between the time in, uh, in which we had reference with no FRD and the time we had with the FRD looks quite the same and even in percentage over time 
it's quite the same. When we compared it to the uh, commercial plant, to the full commercial plant on the other graph, it also looked quite the same, a difference of few percentage. This is not what we wanted from this technology. We wanted better technology, better performance. We wanted 15 to 20 percentage improvement. We did not get, the, get these results, but we are continuing with the innovative cartridges to try to uh, achieve the, the energy uh, efficiency. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have the third uh, pilot. The third pilot is uh, the photobioreactor, uh, aiming to reduce the nitrates, which are nutrients. We don't want to put them in the ocean since they, are, uh, they could cause an environmental impact. Uh, and we are also trying here to create some kind of economical value from the algae that we are growing on, the, on this uh, brine. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can see the, the, the two uh, uh, modules of the pilot. You can see in purple the, the light that we are adding to enhance the product, production of the algae. And in, uh, the red, uh, in the red picture, you can see the, the accumulation of the algae that we are removing from the system uh, in order to keep the performance and in order to uh, uh, make advantage of this uh, uh, product maybe that could come out of this uh, implementation. Next slide, please. Uh, we have been monitoring uh, the uh, algae population of, uh, of this reactor. We are trying to do our best to control it, to encourage the best uh, population of the algae to enable the fastest uh, uh, nitrate uh, removal. And uh, we have some preliminary uh, results here of two batches of uh, brine. You can see some kind of a mirror picture between the upper uh, graph and the lower graph. On the upper graph, the TN, which stands for uh, total nitrogen, you can see uh, it is going down and then it is going down once more after we replace the, the brine. And on the other graph in the TOC, uh, you can see uh, beneath it that the TOC is like a mirror. It's, it increases when the nitrates go down and the algae grow. And when we replace the batch, it happens once more. So these are some positive uh, findings and we continue with this uh, pilot. Next slide, please. Um, last but not least, uh, the pilot in uh, Italy. Uh, here we have a combination of uh, different uh, technologies, thermal evaporation, chemical treatment, and forward osmosis in order to uh, find the best configuration to create some kind of uh, mineral harvesting from the brine. Brine is a resource, economical uh, circular economy here in, in reality, in a very practical manner, uh, trying to, to, to choose the best configuration to achieve that. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can see those uh, units in action. Um, the, in gray, you can see the the, um, the chemical pretreatment in red, the evaporator, and in blue, the forward osmosis, which is a very innovative uh, technology. And you can see the operating uh, conditions in which those uh, units work. And uh, next slide, please. You can see the uh, um, different configuration that were tested in Italy. Uh, and so far, it seems like the middle one out of the three looks the best in terms of uh, the energy and the recovery. And the team in Italy will continue to, to optimize the, the configuration and the performance in order to have the best uh, performance of the uh, mineral recovery. Next slide, please. Uh, so this was a brief, very brief overview of what we are doing in Work Package 4. 
Uh, as I said in the beginning, we are trying to, to be more, very focused on two, uh, two main bottlenecks for the salination, the energy uh, consumption and the brine management. And I hope we will uh, achieve that with all those uh, activities. Thanks very much to all the teams in uh, Israel, Italy and Tunisia for their contribution for this presentation and of course for the actual work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sivan. So you have seen, uh, you have seen that Fit for Reuse is addressed to several solutions and several pilot system has been built within the COVID era. So not easy for us, but now the old of the system are ongoing. So now uh, is the turn of Rafael Casieles from Biazul. Rafael is a project manager at Biazul and is following a very important part of the project. So different consortium country, in different consortium country, we are testing the effects that uh, non-conventional water resources can have on irrigation practices. That is the work package number six of the project. And now Rafael will talk about this. Thank you, Rafael. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Atili, for this uh, presentation. Uh, so far, we have uh, talked a lot about uh, technology uh, when we deal with water reuse. Uh, and it's true, technology is very relevant uh, because we need to ensure that the quality of our water is enough for the different uses. Um, but now we have to talk about other kind of aspects, other, other dimensions that are relevant. And um, in Fit for Reduce, we also want to uh, remove other barriers that are there to, to spread the use of uh, reclaimed water, to spread the uh, water reduce uh, practices. And in this sense, we are uh, in work packages wor working with, um, with these barriers. And in particular, we are developing uh, tests in uh, I different irrigation sites and to assess different impacts. Um, this uh, work package is led by uh, by Osul, and we I'm presenting here task 6.2, which is led by a company, a French company, Cofilae, and also with the contribution of University of Bologna and ISBAT. Um, well, so the, the objective will be to uh, understand, to assess the impacts of using reclaimed water in different aspects, like agro uh, agronomic aspects, environmental, and sanitary. Uh, through different is, uh, impacts. Uh, we are testing these uh, dimensions in, uh, in different test sites. Um, we have already developed a common experimental scheme, which is uh, available in the website, and uh, results are due to next year, to November 2022. So we are now really in the process of obtaining those uh, results. Um, here we have an overview of the different pilot sites that we have. Um, our first pilot, it's in, uh, in France, in Montpellier, run by Ecofilae. Uh, we have also uh, uh, two pilots in Italy, in the University of Bologna and Cesena, and a third pilot in, 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 Tunis in Tunisia. Um, these are the three pilots which are being running uh, in under uh, fit for use, but we also have other two sites uh, which are, let's say, out of fit for reuse, but are providing uh, also data and information so we can complement um, uh, our project results. These are uh, the test site in uh, La Grande Motte in France and also a rich water project in, uh, in South Spain. Um, well, in all these uh, test sites, we are assessing five impacts. First impact is uh, the effect of using reclaimed water in the irrigation system. In particular, we are assessing which are uh, the, uh, what's the effect in the, in the clogging of the drippers. We know that reclaimed water uh, can affect and have more uh, probability of uh, having clogging in the, in, the, in the irrigation equipment. So it's important in this case for farmers to understand what's the most adequate equipment to irrigate using reclaimed water. Also, we need to uh, evaluate the sanitary hazards um, in, the, in the reclaimed water in order to uh, minimize all the health risks that, that we, can, we may have consuming uh, uh, agronomic products irrigated with, with reclaimed water. Also, it's important salinity and sodicity because some crops are um, very sensitive to high levels of, of salinity and sodicity, and we need to know in which cases we 
can irrigate with, with reclaimed water and in which cases we may have to uh, mix and have a, a diluted water with other sources. Also, it's important, uh, another impact is uh, uh, fertilizers and um, potential leaching. This is because reclaimed water has already containing uh, nutrients in, uh, inside, so uh, this can be an opportunity because we, we are able to reduce cost uh, uh, through irrigation. We need less amount of fertilizer. But if we don't take into account how much nutrients are, if we, know, if we don't monitor properly um, nutrients inside reclaimed water, we may pollute more our uh, groundwater resources and our surface waters. And this is diffuse pollution from agriculture is one of the main sources of, uh, of pollution in our waters. So, uh, and finally, uh, we need to assess water quality in storage. We tend to focus only in the, in the effluent of our wastewater treatment plant, but there is life after uh, after treatment. Uh, Recreating water has to be transported, has to be storage before uh, being used in our ir irrigation systems, and we need to monitor also that uh, part of the story. Um, these impacts will be uh, assessed in, at, at different levels. We will uh, Depending on the impact, we are going to uh, define different parameters, these different control parameters. For example, for dripper clogging, we will measure suspended solids in, uh, in the irrigation water and also the flow uh, in, the, in the drippers, in the meters. We will uh, uh, monitor sanitary hazards, uh, those uh, included in the, in the European regulation on water reuse, like E. coli, salmonella, nematodes, or, or legionella. Um, Something that has been required by the Prima Foundation is to, uh, to monitor also uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in order to survey uh, the presence of uh, coronavirus in our wastewaters. So this also will be performed in our uh, case studies. We will uh, monitor um, micropollutants that were mentioned in the previous session that, uh, to check if they are removed or, or not and what's the presence in the crops, uh, in particular uh, diclofenac and bisphenol A. And, um, with regards to salinity, we will monitor uh, uh, conductivity and also uh, some ions like sodium, magnesium, potassium, and, uh, and calcium. We will monitor uh, nutrients contained in the, in, in the water and, and pH, and also we will monitor E. coli in the, in the storage systems. Um, I will explain a little bit about the different case studies. Uh, we have one case, uh, one test site in Cesena, Italy, uh, which is in the uh, in the wastewater treatment plant. Um, uh, here we are testing uh, the effects of the reclaimed water in the irrigation of uh, peach orchards and also in uh, tomatoes. Um, we also, in this case, we we have installed lysimetric cases to do some uh, measures at different uh, depths. And uh, another case study in Italy, it's carried out in, uh, in Bologna, and uh, also getting water from a municipal wastewater treatment plant, and there are some lysimetric cases installed there. In Tunisia, we are working with uh, nature-based solutions uh, that will, and the effluent will be used to irrigate some flowers. And in France, we have a, a test site with non-conventional wastewater treatment uh, technologies and solutions, in particular uh, reed beds. And it's, it's, uh, here we have a different combination of technologies. We have reed beds and also uh, electroxidation, gravity membranes, and UV reactors. And uh, also we have um, uh, irrigating, we are irrigating here lettuce and tomatoes. Um, finally, we have in Spain, uh, project which was funded in the Horizon 2020 uh, program. It, it's uh, already f finalized. It's the Rich Water Project uh, coordinated by Biosul. Here we have a membrane bioreactor and, um, and we irrigate subtropical crops in the, in the region of Laxarchia, which is uh, one of the main producers of subtropical crops in, in Europe. And, uh, well, we so far, we only have uh, preliminary results on the fertilizers uh, basis. So we are in the process of obtaining uh, the other data, but we can uh, check already some uh, preliminary results. In, 
Uh, in general, we can see in the different sites that there is uh, less need of fertilizers when we irrigate with reclaimed water. Um, however, it's true that uh, we, have, we, we don't have uh, like uh, a homogeneous uh, collection of data. Uh, we have very variation in, in, in the figures, probably due to the uh, changing of nutrients content in the wastewater. And uh, I, I think we need here more long-term experiments to, uh, to have more conclusive uh, data. But um, uh, this is due to because nutrient content depends not only uh, on the day we collect the samples, but also in, uh, uh, on the time we collect the samples. It's not the same nutrient content we, if we collect wastewater uh, in the early morning, we, we tend to go more frequently to the toilet, for example, than if we do it uh, at midnight. So these things probably influence uh, our, our data. Uh, nevertheless, we have a range of variation, and in some cases we are even uh, achieving seven, 70 or 19 percent of savings in fertilizers. Um, if we have a look to rich water project, we have more conclusive data because this project is finished. And uh, here we have 46 percent savings in potassium, 65 percent um, in um, phosphate, and 70 percent in uh, nitrate. These uh, results are validated are, uh, by the ETV program, the Environment, Environmental Technology Verification. So they are certified under a, a, a verification, external verification a body and tell us that there is a strong potential for uh, saving uh, in fertilizers. This is also one of the main points, uh, one of the main benefits of using reclaimed water. Um, yeah, we also verified in, uh, in a rich water uh, project uh, uh, achieving the, uh, the quality standards of the uh, water reduce uh, regulation. Uh, here we have the, um, the validated data, and, uh, and this is also very relevant because one of the main uh, barriers that we found when, when using reclaimed water is social acceptance. People, farmers, are reluctant to use reclaimed water, maybe not in our field, we are scientists, uh, we, we know that uh, reclaimed water can have very high quality, but farmers or consumers, uh, they don't necessarily need to know this. So uh, having a verification, verified da data, it's very good to remove those barriers. Um, well, this is uh, up to, uh, all from my side. Um, yeah. Thank you, Rafa. Try to be Thank quick. You. Thank you. Would you give me? So thanks, Rafa. As you can see, we, has, we are developing several solutions, but this solution has to be also extrapolated in different case study. And with, uh, the, the, with this aim, we are developing a simulation tool. And this simulation tool is developed by um, Ozlem Karam Ozgun, that is a, who is a professor at the Istanbul Technical University. He's a partner from Fit for Use. Hello, Ozlem, are you here Hi, with Atelier. us? Hi, Can you hear me? Yes, yes, perfect. I don't know if you have to share your screen. Yes, I think the regime will do that for me. I'm sharing it already. We don't see your screen at, at this moment. Okay, now, now you see your presentation. Please, Azlem, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atilio. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my uh, regards from Istanbul. And I will be quick with the simulation platform presentation so that uh, we can keep up with our time a little bit. Okay, so, um, first of all, I would like to start with why do we need a simulation platform? Um, we know that simulation platforms are really thought to be effective tools to mimic the performances of real systems. The real systems, as Francesco and uh, other participants have uh, already explained, can be really um, complex and it's not always easy to understand how they are performing with different conditions, with changing environmental and our operational uh, conditions that we're 
uh, we can experience during the operation. So it's a good idea to have a computer simulation uh, to uh, give us some idea about the performance of uh, the real systems um, in case of differences in the operating or environmental conditions. Um, so when we started the Fit for Use project, we thought that uh, having a simplified tool for the Fit for Use solutions could be a good idea to uh, use for, especially for decision making, because uh, if you want to uh, reuse some uh, wastewater, depending on your purpose you have to find out the best configuration you need for that um, like for example if you need a, uh, if you want to use an anaerobic reactor together with a constructed wetland with improved aeration you can just uh, uh, run it in your computer and see your results uh, if this will gonna fit your purpose or not, you can decide on that. Or you can uh, wonder if we, what happens if you try an anaerobic MBR solution with an absorption unit attached to that, and you can still have an idea, a sense of what you're going to get without uh, actually running um, pilot or uh, real lab case systems, right? So a computer simulation platform can be uh, really useful in order to uh, make the decisions for configuring the best uh, solutions for, for the requirements. And um, our target has been uh, being able to simulate the different scenarios for different cases. For example, if you're going to produce potato to, uh, to be processed as potato chips in Turkey, in, uh, in the uh, middle uh, Anatolia, at Konya, for example, then you need a uh, reclaimed water of class B and this is totally a different wastewater, totally a different case, totally a different scenario. But if you're going to grow some lettuce in Imola, Italy, that will be uh, requiring a class A water with a uh, totally different uh, characteristics of domestic wastewater. So it's also useful to simulate the different scenarios for uh, different places around the Mediterranean. And uh, the platform is uh, based on the idea that if we simulate the single units, uh, that the, these are the solutions of fit for use, uh, they, they are uh, either nature-based solutions or intensive or compact solutions that uh, we have been studying in the project. It, it's possible to make the process trains out of these solutions uh, as you like to configure. So uh, the simulation platform eventually will give you the water quality, uh, but we are not only looking for the reclaimed water quality, but also uh, the energy consumption and the carbon footprint of your uh, selection. So whenever you configure your process train, you are going to get the uh, uh, get how much energy you'll be needing to run the system and how much carbon footprint you'll be producing uh, at the end of the operation. So these are also uh, nice outputs to uh, you to, to use for decision making to, for the best best solution uh, to to select the best solution. And the simulation platform is not a complicated one. We have a user-friendly graphical user interface, and it's really easy to use. We have designed it to uh, allow you to uh, have uh, flow splitting. That is, you might run two parallel lines of processes if you need to do so. Um, 
and you can adjust your process parameters and reactive configurations as uh, required uh, according to your design system, for example. And the dynamic simulations uh, give you uh, the results of a continuous system, so the simulation platform does not just work and stop for batch uh, operations, but you can run this for um, continuous systems so that you can see the uh, impact of seasonal changes or any fluctuations in the flows or the um, pollutant concentrations. Uh, so you can, ma um, you can observe and monitor the uh, performance of your system um, in case of these changes. And you can monitor your results from uh, your from from the graphics, or you can get the data as files. You can have uh, Excel files. You can uh, save them on your computer. And I have a small uh, video of just three minutes. Just let me get up this point here. Yeah. Okay, so the uh, simulation code looks like this. It's a uh, really long code, at, even at the moment, and we are uh, keeping on developing it. But eventually, it will be just a button where you click to start the simulation platform. It will be loaded. You'll get the uh, user uh, interface, and uh, then you have the processes on the left side, and you'll just simply drag and drop a process that you want to put in your, uh, include in your process train, and then you will uh, import the uh, basic parameters, the volumes, the sludge retention times, and some uh, coefficients that would be required to run the model in that unit and uh, load your input file, which will contain your flow rate, your pollutant concentrations, etc. And then the simulation will run and you will get the results. You can get the results for any component of the pollutant for each unit. And uh, here we had only one unit, for example, in this video, and five components were uh, described, and you can get the results for all of those five components. Um, and now the video will show us how we can split the flow easily, make two uh, different process trains whenever uh, Required, so we just split the input to the first line, that is unit A1. Fifty percent of the flow will go through this um, first line, and the rest will be flowing through the second process line, and then we will get the simulation results. And here it's very important because this will give us another um, perspective about using different combinations of different processes. And sometimes if the flow is, uh, has to be split into two and then it will be combined again, this will create a better solutions whenever required. You can adjust all the settings here. Uh, we show how the integration settings are changed. And we have a, a nice user manual, easy to understand. And all the uh, different users can uh, really easily uh, run this simulation tool and um, get the, their systems and system results uh, in just a few mouse clicks. Um, so this is uh, more or less what we have at the moment. 
and with the application of the simulation platform it will be used as a tool to predict the performances of different reuse process schemes for different water quality and different treatment requirements even from uh, season to season right and uh, of course this will reduce the need for specific case studies at each region uh, the, the cases are different so uh, we don't need to build pilots everywhere all around the Mediterranean but we can uh, get some idea about how the systems will perform at different regions of the Mediterranean and of course this will be uh, used to integrate different process schemes for the developed technologies and it will uh, sure assist the decision makers for the sustainable reuse of water resources and these are our website and links to re reuse to reduce thank, thank you, you. <clears throat> thank you thank you a lot thanks a lot Ozlem. We are a little bit late, I'm very sorry about this, so dear participant, we are going to a break now, but we have, we have to reduce the break, so if uh, the five minutes break, okay, five minutes break, so we try to recover the time, and please uh, stay with us after a little break. Thank you very much. The participant uh, online could have the possibility to, to, to make questions via, via chat. Thank you. See you in five minutes. Just unmute. You have you have put it. Unmute your now. Can you hear me? Yeah, the presentation is perfect. Can you pass the slide? Yeah, one more.
Okay. Okay, so we are back. We will continue with a, a different aspect of the Fit for Use project. All the solutions you have seen and we are developing are followed by an holistic assessment in order to make sure that they are cost effective and applicable at also in different scenarios of the Mediterranean region. So this aspect is followed by different colleagues. Today we have Matteo Ituari, a professor at my university, the University of Bologna. Matteo will tell us about this assessment and also scenarios that the project is developing. Matteo, are you here? I'm here. Hi, Attilio. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Good morning, Matteo. Thanks okay. to be here. You, you, you can share your, your screen. And you should be able to, are you able to see my screen now? Not yet. Yes, yes, yes. Now, yeah. yes. Thank you, Matteo. The floor is yours. OK. Thank you very much, Attilio. And as you anticipated, uh, I'm going to introduce a bit the work we are doing uh, on uh, the assessment uh, of the different uh, solutions that are developed within uh, Fit for Reuse. Uh, so I'm looking at the assessment of the impact uh, of the use of uh, uh, non conventional water resources uh, in the project. So, So uh, the objective of, uh, of the work is to assess the sustainability of the unconventional water <laughs> systems uh, that we have developed within uh, the, uh, uh, the project. What we want to do is to uh, try to integrate and to understand the trade-offs between the different uh, dimensions related to environmental impacts, uh, social impacts, uh, and economic uh, and financial uh, profitability. And we want to develop uh, decision support tools in order to just understand how to improve uh, and, uh, let's say, to better tailor uh, the, the project, the, 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 the different solutions. What are the specific objectives of the work that we are carrying out? Uh, for the first step is to uh, develop uh, an operational methodological framework uh, that will enable us to analyze the uh, triple bottom line impacts uh, of the different unconventional water reuse systems. Then, once we have uh, uh, developed a methodological framework, uh, we are going to set up the baseline scenarios uh, uh, collecting data uh, in order to identify the potential hotspots uh, where we can, let's say, work on the, uh, uh, in terms of improvement uh, of, the, uh, of the different impacts. And obviously, we, we want to uh, work on, uh, let's say, minimizing environmental impacts uh, and maximizing uh, social impacts and minimizing the cost in the uh, uh, operations related to the uh, technologies that have been selected within the, the project. The, the, the third step, let's say, starting from the identification of the hotspots, is the identification of potential improvements in the sustainability of fit for reuse systems by looking at specific alternative or integrated scenarios. So what we have done so far, so far we have developed the methodological framework, uh, working on different methodologies. The uh, most important methodological base is uh, life cycle thinking. Uh, we have integrated LCA, LCC, and SLCA, so life cycle assessment in order to look at environmental impacts, life cycle costing to look, to look at costing impacts, monetary impacts, let's say, and uh, social life cycle assessment to look at social impacts. Plus, we are integrating life cycle thinking together with the cost benefit analysis. With the uh, methodology that uh, we have developed already, we started to collect data in order to develop the baseline uh, 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 scenario. So the data collection is still ongoing. And with this data, what we are doing is also to, uh, say, to try to develop the, uh, and to get the first results in terms of life cycle assessment for the uh, pilot scale technologies. And we are going to look at, at least in, 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 one, in uh, one of the cases, uh, how we are handling these, uh, uh, 
these results for the pilot scale te uh, technologies. The last step of the work is related to the to the development of the alternative scenarios. That is something that uh, we uh, still have to complete, and we are going to focus in, in this case uh, on different territorial, geographical, and issues that uh, are characterizing the involved countries. So, uh, looking at uh, the approach that we are taking, uh, we can say that we are taking two viewpoints. One is the viewpoint at the technology scale, and uh, at the technology scale, in terms of methodology, we are uh, applying both uh, uh, ELCA, so life cycle uh, assessment with an attributional perspective, and uh, a combination of uh, financial analysis uh, and conventional life cycle costing. While the second viewpoint is uh, the territorial scale, editorial, at the territorial scale, uh, together with uh, an environmental and uh, a financial or economic perspective, we are also adopting uh, a social perspective, as uh, uh, I was mentioning before, by applying uh, a social life cycle assessment. And we are uh, willing to work uh, with this methodology in the different pilot that we are developing uh, Within, uh, within the project. What are the pilots? What are the sites that we are working at? Uh, we are working on uh, five sites. Uh, two sites are uh, in Tunisia, one site is in Italy, one site in Greece, and one site uh, in Israel. And all the sites are characterized by, let's say, different features uh, in terms of non-conventional water origin, type of water uh, reclamation technology, and type of water reuse. And, and use. In terms of uh, non-conventional water origin, we are working with uh, municipal wastewaters, uh, brine from Braxic, uh, <laughs> salinization, and Braxic uh, uh, groundwater. In terms of uh, uh, type of water, the key. Sorry, Matteo, we have uh, some problems with the microphone that is open. We don't know. Where? Just a moment, few seconds. Yeah, I probably think it is the Yeah, it should be fine now because I see that the support has closed the microphone. Yes, please go on, Matteo. We have to to, okay. to see again your presentation. Can you see my presentation? Just a moment. few seconds. I don't know if uh, you are still sharing your presentation. I'm still sharing. I can uh, I can redo that if necessary. I, uh, just a moment. I ask if we can see the presentation. We don't see the presentation yet. Okay, Matteo, go on. Okay, thank you. So going back to, let's say, this slide at least. Uh, so we are collecting data from uh, the five pilots uh, of uh, Fit for Reuse. And where are these uh, five pilots? Two pilots are in Tunisia, one pilot is in Italy, one in Greece and one uh, in Israel. And uh, these pilots are characterized by different uh, uh, characteristics uh, in terms of uh, non-conventional water origin, type of water uh, re reclamation technology, and type of water reuse uh, and end use. In terms of uh, uh, non-conventional water origin, we are working with uh, municipal wastewaters, brine from, from Braxic uh, with, uh, water uh, desalinization, and Braxic uh, groundwater. In terms of type of water uh, reclamation technologies, we are working with different technologies in the different uh, sites, uh, ranging from uh, nature-based uh, inten and intensive uh, uh, solutions, uh, nature-based solutions for brine treatment, uh, and intensive solution only. So, uh, in one case, uh, in the case of uh, Tunisia, we have a single technology. In other cases, uh, we have a combination of technologies. And in terms of type of water reuse and end use, uh, we are looking at direct or indirect uh, re reuse for crop uh, uh, irrigation, 
brine di discharge and biomass uh, uh, barolization and uh, uh, desalinated water for uh, potable user use uh, and uh, irrigation. Okay. So we are applying, uh, let's say, different technologies to different uh, situations. In order to, let's say, keep the time and uh, uh, to not to look uh, in, in uh, a too superficial way to the, to the different cases, we are going to focus uh, today on a, a single case, which is the case of Emilia-Romagna Marche region uh, in Italy. Uh, in, in, in the case of this site, we are uh, looking at uh, non-conventional uh, non wastewater origin municipal wastewater. In terms of uh, reclamation technology, we are using a combination of nature-based and intensive solutions, and the end use is the direct use for crop uh, irrigation. So to give some, uh, uh, let's say, highlights uh, on the on the, let's say, territorial challenges and benefits and technical challenges and benefits as perceived by local communities because these uh, information are coming out from consultation that has been, end, has been handled during the, uh, uh, the previous months. So there are no major uh, social conflicts in, uh, in the region and there are, uh, let's say, already implemented and uh, uh, operational units in the province of Bologna, in Emilia uh, Romagna region, and there is a presence of a wetland plant in the province of Ancona, in the Marche region, which is not currently under uh, operation. In terms of technical benefits and, uh, and challenges, these solutions are, are seen as well suited for uh, specific uh, situations in uh, small and rural areas. In terms of a challenge, which is also an, uh, an opportunity, uh, there is quite an attention on the combination between small and large wastewater treatment technologies and plant treatments uh, to have, uh, let's say, to develop an applied technology with uh, a sustainable cost for the Mediterranean region. Uh, here you can see uh, a preliminary uh, visualization of the scenarios that we are working uh, at. Uh, as I was anticipating, the, the scenarios are uh, looking at alternative solutions. So uh, one scenario is uh, uh, based on the reuse, uh, taking advantage of the fit for reuse technologies. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, the, uh, let's say the final output are uh, reclaimed water of, cl uh, of class A. The second scenario is uh, reuse with conventional technologies. Uh, in this case, the final output is uh, uh, reclaimed water of class B and C, and uh, the uh, business as, as usual sh uh, scenario where uh, treated water, uh, wastewaters uh, are uh, discharged. And here you can see, let's say, uh, some of the preliminary results related to uh, LCA, which is really, really uh, at the beginning in terms of, uh, let's say, current results. What is important is that we are looking at results at the pilot scale level. And what we will do is uh, 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 to create estimate to bring, uh, uh, to make the, uh, the results more, more consistent and more meaningful also for uh, a larger scale. So uh, we are working in, in a similar way uh, in the different uh, sites. So in the five sites, uh, uh, of uh, the Fit for Use project, so not only uh, uh, in Italy, but uh, also in the two cases uh, in Tunisia, in the case of Greece uh, and in the case of uh, uh, Israel, to understand uh, and to analyze uh, in a, let's say, with a more holistic approach, so integrating uh, environmental, economic uh, and social impacts uh, uh, for the different technologies that uh, are applied to, to, to the different contexts. We are finalizing the baseline scenarios uh, uh, at, at the moment, uh, and uh, that is going to be the starting point for the development uh, of uh, alternative scenarios. Uh, as uh, we have seen in the case of Italy, they are going to focus on business as usual. So what is happening now, uh, reuse with conventional technologies. Uh, so what can happen if we adopt uh, conventional technologies and uh, reuse with fit for reuse uh, technology. So what are the benefits that uh, we can ensure uh, uh, in terms of envir uh, uh, environmental uh, 
performances, economic performances and, and social benefits by applying the fit for reuse technologies. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry for having been say, so short. I hope you, you have get also part of the, uh, uh, of the beginning of the, uh, of the presentation. Sorry to not to be there with you. And thanks again, Attilio, for, uh, uh, for the time and for the attention. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe uh, that our participants are getting more interested in the project Fit for Reuse. If you are, you are well, very welcome to join our stakeholder, multi-stakeholder platform and uh, our stakeholder community. And about this, uh, now uh, the last presentation of the Fit for Reuse project will be done by Maria Chiarasole, a researcher at the, at the Italian Institute for Environmental Protection and research that um, who is coordinating the building and the function of this multi-stakeholder and multi-level multi platform. Hello, Maria Chiara. How are you? Could Hello, you hear us? Video. Can you hear oh. me well? Yes, perfectly. Please, Perfect. could you share your screen? I shared it. Don't you see it? Not yet. But now, yes, so no, now we are seeing yet the screen of Matteo, I believe. So now it's, fine. Oh, now it's okay, Maria Chiara. Okay, so I start. Just, uh, just a moment. Okay. okay, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria Chiara. Please go on. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to present uh, the multi-stakeholder platform. Um, that is, of course, the basis for networking and uh, knowledge exchange. So um, this is uh, one, the, the platform is related to the third pillar of the Fit for Use project, the assessment and regulations, which involves uh, the, the development of this platform that has been conceived exactly for creating a community around the project and around non-conventional water resources. In particular, uh, through the platform, we uh, want to establish uh, a mechanism for knowledge co-production and also participatory vision building process to improve the perception of non-conventional water resources that, as it has been said before, it is very relevant and important. Uh, of course, it is also a uh, support for the operational networking among the project partners, but also uh, relevant stakeholders. It takes into account the progress and the results of the Fit for Use project. And the main objective is to reach the widest range, range of stakeholders, including users and citizens, also thanks to the customized interfaces. So in this presentation, that I, I will be very quick, but I want to give you just uh, an overview on uh, how the platform works, because of course we all, uh, we are, you are all invited to join the community of the Fit for Use project by registering uh, on the platform at the link that is indicated here, and that is possible to find it also on the Fit for Use uh, website. So very easily, the, the registration procedure uh, consists in uh, uh, connecting to the platform, insert the email address, and uh, you will receive uh, uh, a registration link uh, to, to your email. If you don't, please check the, the spam folder. Sometimes it happens. And uh, once you have chosen your, your password, uh, you will be asked to agree with the uh, privacy policy that, of course, is in line with the GDPR rules uh, of the European Commission. So uh, once you are uh, in the platform, the user uh, is directed uh, directly in the dashboard, that is uh, uh, this one that you see in the slide and it is possible to set the preferences for notifications 
uh, in the activity section and uh, through the customize but, uh, button that is uh, um, at the end of the page uh, also it is possible to decide which one uh, of those uh, um, of those windows you would like to see on the dashboard so uh, for example recommended files but also the uh, upcoming events or talk mentions about other possibilities the files uh, section uh, is uh, basically a repositories uh, in which you can find several documents and for now there are already a few uh, documents related to the project and that are relevant documents uh, also we have the uh, proceedings and all the uh, key uh, results of the first water use days and of course you will also find the thematic uh, the documents related to the thematic forums uh, among among other among other documents in this section uh, you can see also uh, you can check the activities done by the other users so day by day and uh, uh, this one this section that is called the talk section but also we we like to call it the forum section is uh, uh, is an important one uh, because this section allows the users to create uh, thematic forums and also to chat among uh, uh, users uh, or individually or also by creating thematic groups and uh, within those forums, uh, documents, links, and uh, other materials can, uh, can be shared. We have also a calendar in which you can find the event or, or, or also the, uh, the new forums that uh, uh, will be launched. And uh, uh, the survey section is dedicated uh, to, to surveys and questionnaires, uh, thematic questionnaires that are very relevant for the project because in this way it is possible also for us to gather information and feedbacks uh, uh, from the stakeholders. So this is uh, my last slide, this is uh, an anticipation that uh, it is important uh, to, to share today because uh, we would like to, to inform you that uh, this forum section uh, will be used uh, to foster collaboration and to promote discussion and knowledge, uh, knowledge sharing amongst the users. So from now on, every month we will propose a topic of discussion uh, related to water reuse. Uh, um, we, we will share something re regarding European projects, but also relevant news, etc. And uh, of course, stakeholders uh, play a crucial role in this discussion because they will be asked to join the discussion, the, to share their point of view and uh, any other relevant information they, they want to share. And within the same, uh, the same platform, the relevant documents and other materials uh, will be saved within the file, uh, file section. So we hope that this is also a new activity that will help the project in, uh, uh, in developing networking and also knowledge exchange uh, to uh, improve the, uh, the one of the objective of the of the fit for use project so stay tuned and uh, again as the slogan of fit for use says help us reuse to reduce thank you very much thank you thank you a lot maria chiara thanks a lot we finished the presentation of the main activity for this, se this second water reuse day. Now it's time. I hope you enjoyed the, 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 the project, the presentation, and I hope you will be able to be more and more interested and uh, follow us in the multi-stakeholder platform as well as uh, via web websites, social media, and so on. This is the time now for our uh, round table, so I leave the floor to Ray again, and I would like to thank all of you so much. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. So, as Atilio said, we're now moving on to our next round table, uh, this time on reusing non-conventional water resources in the innovative water food nexus concept. And for that, I will now give the, give the floor to Antonia Lorenzo, CEO of Bio Azul. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Hello, this is the last one. <laughs> you are very brave. <laughs> okay, so this is, yeah, I'm Tony, Antonia Lorenzo from Bayazul. Bayazul is a water engineering company located in the south of Spain, and we have been working in several projects and activities related to uh, water reuse, and we are um, quite, oh no, oh sorry, I forgot, <laughs> thank you. Uh, to be here today, we are a partner of Fit for Reuse project and we are also partner on the water scarcity program. Um, and I would like now that the people that are going to, my friends <laughs> are coming here, so please Attilio, you again can join me in the table, the drawing table, Nuno, Broco, uh, Simos, Maladis and Maria Cristina Passi, please. Thank you. <laughs> Please take a, take a seat. Yeah. Uh, I'll go to the center. Okay, yeah. okay. thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Nuno. Thank you. Yeah, so um, this round table is about this innovative uh, Nexus concept on water um, and food. Um, but before I start asking some questions uh, to, to the um, persons uh, which are with me today here, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about what is Nexus approach. So I was just uh, looking at the United Nations definition about this that is uh, from already 2015 or something like that. The one I, I was looking for, so this Nexus approach is looking for the sustainable management of water, soil, and also energy, and it's dealing also with the waste, and it's going forward now with the ecosystem. So the Nexus is integrating all this environmental management but also governance across sectors and scales. So the idea of implementing this Nexus is really focused on having great impacts at social level, environmental level, but also economic level. And when we talk about Nexus, we talk about reducing the use of resources and also giving them more this circularity. We were talking about circularity today as well. So this is really the, the heart, the, the core of this Nexus approach. Also, um, the Prima Foundation manager was talking about this interconnection, so how we can see water, food, energy, ecosystem, how we can interconnect them and apply oh, these approaches which are uh, contributing uh, to preserve the environment and the biodiversity but ensuring at the same time that we are producing food for everyone. So implementing water food nexus projects um, contributes to the reduction of this environmental risk and also these ecological scarcities we are talking about during the whole day, especially under this current uh, context of uh, climate change, population growth, and also very important is um, consumption patterns we have which are key also when we talk about the transition. So we have to change the way we consume That's the, to understand better uh, when we consume uh, the resources that are behind and how everything is interconnected. So that was my introduction. And then I will go uh, one by one with my first question. And also I will leave also the floor to them to introduce themselves. Um, you know already Atilio Toscano, which is a full professor at the University of, of Bologna. Maria Cristina Passi is the manager director of ISAR and also is a senior, senior advisor on innovative uh, approaches in, in the industry, especially in the sustainable chemistry field. Uh, we have also Nuno Bronco, which is the vice president of Aguas de Portugal, uh, Valor. <laughs> and Simos Maladis, which is associated professor at the National uh, Technical University of Athens. So, um, I will start with you, with you too, Maria Cristina. <laughs> okay. So, first of all, I would like that you uh, talk a little bit about um, how, in your daily activities, your daily work, you tackle this nexus on water, food. If there is any activity you are implementing or you are proposing, also for, for these innovations you are bringing to the industry that has to do with this Nexus? Yeah. I would say that really Nexus concept uh, is uh, permeating <laughs> all uh, the yeah. industrial sectors 
dealing and not dealing directly with food. Uh -huh. And beside this, I would say that this nexus approach is also permeating each step of every value chain, whatever it is, linear or circular. And this is the reason why I do prefer to speak about uh, systemic strategic value chains more than circular, even if uh, systemic value chains are circular. But the word system systemic uh, is giving an added value to the circular value chain because it generates, it highlights the interaction that there is necessarily between uh, each circular value chain and uh, external uh, steps of, uh, let's say, alien value chains, which are uh, anyway strictly connected. And uh, I thank you indeed for the presentation of the fit for use because it inspired <laughs> in many, many ways uh, this concept uh, and uh, open uh, infinitive spaces for yep. reflections. For instance, we spoke about, and definitely to answer to your question, uh, in everyday professional life, uh, we are actually, I am actually working on this. Mm -hmm. Uh, looking at the Fit for Reuse project, uh, we spoke a lot about water reuse uh, and we spoke about uh, the recovery of some materials from the brine uh, once the brine is uh, collected uh, out of the desalination process. But I would say that there is the same if we speak about the sludge, which is an outcome from yeah. the water treatment processes. And I do want to say just some few highlights because time is uh, leading the session. So uh, thinking about the sludge and thinking about the industry nowadays and the chemical industry, first of all, uh, the sludge is uh, a tremendous resource also to give an economic value to whatever deals with water reuse. Because uh, if we think about uh, the next challenges from the industrial sectors, and we think about batteries development, for instance, thinking about electromobility, thinking about new energy sources, uh, water is playing a crucial role, uh, as well as the sludge. So if we are all able to offer a quality level treated water, as well as uh, a specific sludge, mm -hmm. which may contain some uh, valuable products, uh, which could fit the famous Nexus value chain uh, with uh, primary resources to be overcome by secondary resources. That would be an economic gain for the water reuse within the Nexus approach. Because uh, to be able to produce batteries for the future need, the future demand inside uh, the European market and also mm -hmm. beyond it, uh, we need to have enough cobalt, manganese, lithium, and phosphorus, first of all. And phosphorus, elemental phosphorus, is uh, the main component of uh, the sludge coming out from the urban wastewater treatment plants in different forms. This phosphorus is really the golden rule, I would say, <laughs> because we need phosphorus to develop both liquid electrolytes and solid phase batteries for the electromobility. So I'm saying this because this morning we talk about the price of water and uh, the lack of uh, attractiveness from an economic perspective. If we think about the alien uh, steps of this systemic value chain, we can find uh, lots of uh, factors which can be 
profitably used uh, really from today on. Okay. And uh, to close this, uh, I would uh, also say that from an industrial perspective, water reuse uh, is definitely towards development of new habilitating technologies uh, mm -hmm. which have to show three different main uh, characteristics. First, uh, release a water that can be reused inside the company, inside the industrial processes, and this is the easiest one. Secondly, the processes, the new industrial processes, have to produce an output process water, which can be reused in other processes and also in agricultural irrigation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And third, which is not the last, industry is very much investing in waterless technologies because that is the option B. We need, as we, we were speaking about this this morning, um, we need obviously to provide water for agricultural purposes because that's for food, for our individual safety. But on the other side, we have also to protect food as the main client of water for our survival. And towards this, we have also to develop technologies which are not using water. And we have some examples, maybe there will be time to speak about them. Okay, thank you, Christina. Yeah, uh, so we have introduced a sludge. We are talking about water reuse, but also a sludge in this nexus as well. I move now to Nuno because, uh, uh, I mean, Christina is talking more from, from the industrial uh, point of view. Uh, and what about the water operators? How do you see this nexus? How do you approach this in your daily work if you do so? <laughs> well, it will be strange if we don't because we are uh, operators, water operators, so water is uh, the center of our activity. And uh, let me step back one moment just to uh, introduce this company, ADP yeah, for of sure, Valor, for sure. and to explain because uh, it's very related with the topic that we are discussing. Uh, Agos de Portugal is a public operator. In Portugal we supply around 80% of national population. And uh, um, we are a public company. And this small company, the youngest company of the group that is called SADP Valor, have been created one year ago just to focus on four uh, main topics. Mm -hmm. First of all, circular economy. Second one, innovation. The third one, um, digitalization. And of course, we have a solid base on engineer engineering. So uh, telling this um, and trying to answer to your question, um, energy neutrality, sludge recovery, and wastewater reuse are three main pillars of our strategy in this moment. We, and we are working on that uh, with the different um, innovation process, but also uh, applying and uh, doing uh, the steps and uh, taking the steps to, 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 to foster these three pillars. The first one, the energy neutrality, we have a very ambitious plan to be neutral by 2030. Uh -huh. So uh, we are the biggest consumer, public consumer in Portugal. We consume around 1.4% uh, of uh, uh, national electrical energy. So you can imagine the challenge that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Then we are, of course, the main uh, sl wastewater uh, sludge producer. We produce around 300 and uh, almost five, uh, 400,000 uh, um, tons per year of sludge. And we operate around 1,000 wastewater treatment plants. Wow. So <laughs> we have a huge quantity of wastewater to uh, reuse. And we are doing uh, some steps in these two last uh, pillars. Of, of course, also in the first one, in the energy neutrality. But in terms of sludge, we are um, turning this kind of uh, uh, non-desirable product mm -hmm. in a very um, attractive product. Uh, most part of you knows the crisis of fertilizers, chemical fertilizers that we have now in Europe. Of course, it's related with energy price. And uh, you also know the strategy of Europe to 
uh, decrease the use of synthetic fertilizers and to promote the use of organic fertilizers. So we are working on that and we believe that in the next two years we will have a set of products driven by um, the sludge and um, we are working in partnership with some, some farmers, some agricultures, mm -hmm. uh, in order to increase this value on these uh, different products. Back to the reuse, and uh, um, just to some figures, um, you know that Portugal is, uh, this morning someone uh, told this, um, we are a very water scarce country, mainly in the south part of the country. Agriculture in Portugal consumes around 72% seven, of the, the, the water, the national resources. We are downstream of Spain, so uh, everything that happens in Spain happens in Portugal in terms of throats. And um, furthermore, the uh, urban sector, the water urban sector, have made an incredible uh, progress in the last year. So we have today a huge number of plants with tertiary treatment and the wastewater is really treated and we have a huge potential to reuse wastewater. But in 2019, and for some of you that don't know very well Portugal, you can imagine that uh, Portugal is uh, uh, reusing a lot of wastewater. That is false. Until 2019, we reuse uh, only around 1.4% uh, of uh, treated wastewater. You know Europe reuses around 2.4, so we are off of the uh, average in Europe, not compared with Spain. And we have made some analysis of bottlenecks, what was wrong at that moment. And uh, there was bottlenecks, important bottlenecks. First of all, uh, different visions uh, for the water resources management in Portugal. Farmers um, have one vision, urban sector another vision, and uh, sometimes politicians another vision. And then um, the regulators, the either the economical, either the environmental regulators have some lacks of instruments to manage this water scarcity. And finally, uh, until 2019, uh, we had a legislation um, uh, that uh, for us, public operators, obliges us for each new operation on wastewater reuse to ask for a new permit. Yeah. So okay. that was a mess to try to, 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 to obtain a permit and uh, we have changed that on the last uh, two years and uh, maybe after I can talk a little about, about that. Yeah, yeah, you, you were mentioning very relevant uh, aspect like this uh, mindset. I mean, uh, you were talking about the bottlenecks uh, for this uh, real water reuse uh, projects. I mean, going to, to the reality uh, and also the, the policy and the regulation. We will come back to that later. I will now, now go to, to Simos. Simos, please introduce yourself. I mean, I, I, I think it's very good that we have here, let's say, industrial water operators, and we also have uh, research scientists that are working on innovations and working on, say, providing uh, these uh, new tools, new evidence for making the water reuse a reality and also for, for making this interconnection. So, Simos, please. Thank you, Antonia, and uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Um, uh, I'm a, an associate professor at the Sanitary Engineering Laboratory of the School of Civil Engineering of the National Technical University of Athens. Um, we deal with um, uh, advanced technologies for wastewater treatment, um, water reuse, sludge management, and uh, we also are involved in um, projects related to nature-based solutions. Mm. Um, we are quite proud uh, by the fact that uh, our laboratory is the one which developed the, the guidelines which later became uh, and are the existing um, um, limits for regarding water reuse, the national limits. So mm -hmm. this came out of a project actually, a life project, and it's one of the few cases where a project was actually able to affect um, legislation. Uh, and um, it's, it's yeah, it's difficult. It's yeah, very it difficult. And it's a long process. I yeah. mean, th this project was almost 20 years ago. So, oh <laughs> <laughs> so uh, since 2011, we have um, the Greek um, water use law governing um, 
in Greece. Um, also in Greece, we don't have um, big um, uh, water reuse. Uh, we have um, less than 5%. And if we, t we talk only about um, direct reuse, not mixing with, uh, with uh, surface water, we are less than 2%, I think. Wow. And um, there are reasons for this. Um, uh, a major th thing that uh, I don't know if other countries face is that the fact that um, in Greece, we have two big cities, and 40% um, of the population is in Athens. So we have a, a very big, very centralized the Fabio facility <laughs> in Psitalia, a small island, uh, where we treat uh, the vast majority of the, um, of, uh, the Athens metropolitan sewage. Wow. So uh, the problem is that uh, uh, there is no path afterwards to valorize it. Uh, where are you going to send it? There was a study made by AIDAP, the, water, the Athens Water Utility, that even if you water the, all of the green spaces of Athens, that are not so many, you would basically use 8% of the uh, 730,000 yeah. cubic meters per day of w water. So the location is, is, diff is, uh, is um, and it's not only a matter of economics, it's a matter of the water energy nexus, because the amount of energy you would need to pump it to agricultural areas where, mm -hmm. which is the prime consumer of water in Greece, above 70% would be immense. Yep. So realistically speaking, at least for the, for the Greek case study, I would say that we wouldn't be able to reach more than 15 to 20%. But even this is a big number, yep. and we're talking about a lot of uh, water that could be saved. Regarding the nexus and your question, I think uh, we deal with it uh, every day. Yeah. Uh, in the past, um, uh, when we're developing solutions for wastewater treatment, we were one-sided, thinking only about the treatment. Now we have to think about uh, the energy footprint, yep. the carbon footprint. Uh, will the water be fit for the purpose it will be uh, regarding the reuse? So all of these interconnections, and then the impact that it will have to the food sector. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned ecosystems. So yep. we're talking about the water, energy, food, ecosystem <laughs> nexus, where nature-based solutions through ecosystem services, I think, have a big play. Yep. So yes, we deal it. And it, it's, it's nice because we are given the opportunity, also as academics, to interact with different disciplines. Yeah. Thank you, Simos. Um, yeah, less than 2% is very low, it's true. I mean, the, the average is 2.4, so it's something, we will talk about this later. Uh, so, Atilio, please, I mean, you, you were yes, talking I, for a while, that's why I... I yes, I, I will try to answer directly to, to, your, <laughs> to your questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> the idea is that uh, I, I'm a professor of agricultural hydraulics so i deal every day with uh, agricultural water management irrigation and so so water supply for irrigation and irrigation systems water the irrigation system is used to irrigate crops food yep. the irrigation process is an energy consumption process and the ecosystems we work on the um, on the on the on the rural areas and uh, we have to supply water for the rural areas, but also we have the drainage from the rural areas. And in the drainage systems, at least in my region, in the Emilia Romagna region, we have water coming from agriculture, where we have a sort of diffuse pollution from nutrients, from pesticides and so on. But also in the drainage canal that usually are used also to irrigate so uh, discharge a lot of wastewater treatment plant, a lot of, of uh, combined sewer overflow. So as you can see, in my opinion, the nexus is there because we have water, energy, food, ecosystems. And also the reuse is central, is crucial in the nexus approach because reusing water means close the, 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 the cycle for sure but also is the link between the urban, ur urban side of the moon and the rural side of the moon. So at these two aspects is uh, already linked. I'm sure that the new European regulation will speed up the process. 
but the reuse in some areas, in some countries, is already uh, performed at least at the indirect level. Because mm -hmm. when a wastewater treatment plant discharge in a canal and uh, uh, several uh, meters downstream, this water is uh, mixed with fresh water, okay, and use it again to irrigate. Uh, the, the question of today, uh, you will be able to eat uh, a salad irrigated yeah. with the wastewater? I, I say yes, but yes, because already we, we, we did it, we, we do it. Uh, but maybe without knowing. Without knowing, yeah. without, uh, without uh, too many control, mm -hmm. uh, without regulation, uh, without risk analysis, where is Francesco? There <laughs> is working, it seems, <laughs> without risk analysis. So the reuse is the future and the reuse is the nexus from my point of view. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So I, I was going to mention also this uh, result of this 71% of uh, people that said that they will eat it. Um, but uh, I don't know if this is representative for, from the whole let's say, consumers. So sometimes I doubt that, that those uh, going into the survey are uh, um, uh, very representative because if you mention it, and we have been working as BioAthur in a thematic network of promoting this um, uh, water reuse in agriculture, and we have been working together with consumer associations. And even though they are, I mean, on a way pushing this uh, because of these environmental concerns and everything, on the other hand, they are still a little bit reluctant. So the acceptance is something very relevant. So regarding this chain of mindset, acceptance, bottlenecks, what do you find in the industry? So you, you work with the industrial stakeholders. Um, where do you see the, the barriers, the challenges? Because the huge potential is here. We were all mentioning there is a lot of water that can be treated, and it will be more because population are growing, we are moving to cities. In cities, you, you have wastewater treatment plants. Uh, so it's a reliable um, source of non-conventional water to be reclaimed and being used. But something is, something is, is not working yeah. well. So we understand the nexus. We understand the need. We have the potential. But from yeah. your point of view, from the industrial side? Or yeah, from, from the industrial side. But uh, um, I would like to give to give an impression also as a citizen, as an individual. Yeah, no, for sure, no, you, you no, can do it, to, oh, sure. Uh, but sure. really, in, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, from an industrial side, but generally speaking, I would say that uh, here there is a real problem of uh, information sharing by adopting the right instruments. Uh, I mean, uh, um, with you know, uh, we all respect the consumers' associations definitely mm -hmm. because uh, uh, these were the uh, let's say the instruments to win many battles in terms of environmental issues and so on. But really, I think that uh, after this global era, globalization era, we need to come back to a sort of local era where the individual has a value as he is, uh, as uh, she is, uh, and we need to focus on this. I think that from an, uh, an industry, an industrial sector perspective, uh, the wide spreading of the ESG divisions, you know, everybody knows about these uh, ESG divisions, which are growing and growing within the different industries, these are the environmental, social, and governance divisions. Each industry uh, has got one, and if they don't, they are acting towards this, mm -hmm. because this uh, environmental, social, and governance issue is going to become relevant in any value chain. And this is a first uh, step, in my opinion, towards uh, increasing the awareness uh, about what is, is already happening, uh, even if the people do not know. Okay. And it is a pity because uh, also from an industrial perspective, uh, um, there is a lot of environmental uh, uh, attention. 
uh, within uh, the new technologies released uh, uh, regarding the water reuse uh, in the industrial cycle, uh, regarding the possibility to offer a right level water output in order to feed other sectors. This is already happening. I think that we need uh, to stress this information sharing with uh, each individual. And uh, one additional issue, you know I'm, uh, you know I'm a scientist, but uh, I'm uh, a very humanistic person, and I do like indeed uh, the education issue. I think that uh, mm -hmm. we have already many examples within the European Union where the next generation is going to be involved in these processes. But in my opinion, we need to start educating our kids from the primary school about these issues. We need to introduce these thematics so that when they are teenagers, they know that the salad <laughs> is already coming from a field which is irrigated by a well-treated water, also properly analyzed because we are also good in uh, public control of the water uh, quality. And so I think that the schools and the children, really the, the kids and also teenagers, have to be involved more in innovative ways, also in the finance projects, taking care of specific activities, uh, finding new ways of uh, interactions in order to make this uh, working properly. This is my opinion. Uh, okay, thank you, Vandy Antonia, Christina. as you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, and I totally agree with you. This, uh, the children are the chain agents, the more yeah. powerful ones. Education is... Yeah, uh, and I, I think uh, this is happening somehow, but um, yeah, it should be promoted. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Nuno, you were mentioning uh, some minutes ago about this potential and that you have started working with farmers, but you, you, you have some bottlenecks. You were mentioning legislation, you were... So, which ones could you give us some examples about uh, why it's not happening as fast as we desire? <laughs> yes, um, let me, let me uh, take the words from Christina because yeah. I'm very sensitive also to the education and the water culture that we need to promote to all our mm -hmm. citizens, uh, to our industrials that are citizens, of course, and to our mayors that are important um, city uh, uh, leaders. And um, just just uh, to, to emphasize that one of the bottlenecks that we identified some two years ago was the trust, the question of the trust. And we, as mm -hmm. public operator, have developed a program to share knowledge and to educate our citizens, uh, sharing information. And um, I believe that is very important to uh, partnership with the uh, um, opinion makers. Okay. And we are doing that uh, with the farmers. We have in Portugal a very uh, young generation of farmers, people that are managing the water in a very clever way, people that are really efficient managing the, the water, and these are our um, main uh, partners for uh, different projects and um, this is one of the topics. The second topic is the mayors. Once again, we must choose uh, the right people to partnership and to bring this message to their peers. Uh, for instance, Lisbon and uh, for those that are not from Lisbon and that will walk in the next uh, days in Lisbon, I invite you to see some fuchsia colors, pipes that we have along the city for reusing wastewater. Okay. Okay. <coughs> and the mayor of uh, Lisbon has been a, a, a guy very, very um, proactive in this topic. And we have developed an important number of uh, initiatives with, with, the, with the city of Lisbon for irrigation of green spaces, for the irrigation, for instance, I, I'm sure that all of you know the Rock in Rio concert, that is a huge event that happens every year in Lisbon for the last 10 years, maybe. And all the green space is irrigated with reused water, and that is published uh, for the people to be aware of that. And 
uh, when you talk this uh, in the early session about the salad to eat the salad uh, irrigated with wastewater some two years ago we have invited people to drink the treated wastewater and uh, how uh, in the best way uh, using the wastewater uh, to make beer so <laughs> we have produced beer uh, with wastewater and I'm not apologist of uh, direct potabilization of uh, wastewater. I think that we have much more uh, uh, fields to use the wastewater, but yeah. that was important as communication uh, um, strategy because the question after that was if, if you drink the wastewater, why don't you uh, eat something that yeah. have been irrigated with that? So the question of trust is very important and we are working on that. Another important um, bottleneck, just to emphasize, uh, it's a, the distance between the, our big cities and the farmers. But we are trying uh, to engage, of course, the, uh, the farmers are the big consumers, we all know that. We have the small plants inside of in the, the mainland of, of the country and the big cities in the coastal area where we have no uh, farming. So. We are trying to solve this equation oh. by creating uh, partnerships with uh, uh, industry. For instance, we have important oh. partnerships with the industry and with uh, the municipalities. Okay, thank you, Nuno. Sami, we were talking about trust, communication activities, uh, opinion leaders. So, but uh, I think, um, and this would be the last question before we take some questions from from the public or from uh, those that are connected. So um, really creating evidence, technical and scientific evidence is totally necessary to back up all this uh, communication and all these activities. Um, what do you think, Simos, about uh, the role of the uh, academy? So I will come back to you as well with this, uh, in, in this, in this puzzle, so <laughs> with all yeah. this for creating evidence and also uh, supporting uh, the transition uh, by increasing the trust or? Yeah. I think uh, it was mentioned also this morning by Fabio in the question about transferability. Uh, you go around, you, you, you test at the initially at a small scale, then at the pilot scale, then at demonstration scale, and you need to provide solid evidence uh, that uh, what you are doing is working and that, that the water that you, you are producing is fit for its purpose. And I can give you, uh, in a two minutes, a very good example good. of our work <laughs> uh, and how uh, we, we are providing evidence to support legislation and reuse. Okay. Um, the, uh, both the, the EU um, regulation and the, uh, and the Greek uh, law regarding water reuse um, require for... Um, unrestricted irrigation or class A if you want for, for the EC, that uh, you do uh, secondary treatment plus uh, filtration uh, plus uh, disinfection. disinfection. Okay? <laughs> so when we applied, uh, when we, we did the, the IDRUSA project and we had to apply for a full scale system well, that, that was going to treat uh, uh, the sewage of, of the village, we had to go all this tedious uh, long, uh, procedure of getting uh, 14 different permissions yeah. for the treatment and for the reuse. And uh, there is chart uh, for, uh, for the treatment of the system and to be re reused for agriculture. In Spain, we have also this chart uh, permission. This chart permission. <laughs> so uh, the, the question was we, we were implementing a solution where we combined uh, uh, constructed wetlands with an aerobic uh, USB process uh, up front. And then the question was. Um, the, the regulation requires tertiary filtration, but the, the, um, the wetlands are, are filtering the, the sewage, but it, it's not explicitly uh, you know, put in, 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 the, in the legislation. It says sun filtration. So uh, we, had to, we had to actually integrate a further treatment step to get the license, uh, a membrane actually. It, we could equally put a sun filter, but now we are actually providing evidence what, that we are producing uh, at full scale reclaimed water um, of suitable for unrestricted irrigation without any use of uh, a further treatment step after the constructed wetland. And this is solid evidence that mm -hmm. the legislation can integrate. Yeah. So this is a good example of um, 
how we can actually support uh, legislation uh, and uh, provide uh, valuable insight on the uh, technologies that can then be replicated and they won't face the problems that we faced uh, previously. Okay, thank you. Anything to add to, <laughs> to this? Because I mean, no, in, it, uh, it, I think it's difficult to, to, because this is evidence that could be used for legislation, but how, how to, to really make the, those decision makers, those that uh, develop the, the regulation, aware of all these evidence and reasons and how to transpose them into the legislation? I fully agree with, with Simos, okay. but um, I think that uh, uh, we are lucky for the entrance into force of the European legislation. Because if we look at the single national legislation, they were terrible, at least in Italy, I believe also in Spain, in, wow. in, in, in Greece, yeah. and, and yeah, so on. So yeah. to have an umbrella uh, at European level could hopefully help us to, to go on. And now the, the challenge is to implement into the single case study, the single study, the, the risk management plan requested by the EU regulation, because there we have space to innovate, to, to create a methodology as we, we want to do within Fit for Use. Uh, we want to apply in relevant case study in Italy. We are applying in several case study in Italy this methodology at full scale and this is yeah. the, the step between the development of a methodology into the real application of a, a methodology well in advance with respect to the guidelines at the European level. Of course uh, this aspect for the first time put together two main sectors the water operators and at the urban level and the farmers and the farmers association and the uh, uh, water distributors at farm level. In, in Italy, we have irrigation consortia, I don't know, mm, in yeah, Portugal or, or, or in Spain, yeah. uh, that manage uh, thousands of kilometers of canal and pipelines to distribute water for irrigation. In my opinion, the next step is to do a, a real planning of the water use, because it's not saying that uh, every wastewater treatment plant is suitable no. to be used for irrigation, for the distance, for the difference of elevation, for example, yeah. for the pumping we need, for the quality of water or, or, or not. So we have to plan, yeah. really, a master plan at, uh, at least regional scale, in my opinion. We have to plan exactly which wastewater treatment plant is potentially suitable for irrigation and what we have to do to make it possible. So in terms of infrastructures, in terms of uh, treatment, in the, at the second level, the farmers, the, the social acceptance is, in my opinion, at two levels. For sure at final consumer level. But I believe that uh, it is not so difficult with education, with uh, evidence, and so on. And the second one is at, at farmer level. But farmer is the, not only a, uh, a, a, a not acceptance uh, uh, by default. It's a, a, a difficult to accept also because they are linked, they are related to European legislation, to European regulation yep. for the safety of, of food products. And, and and also to to achieve, I don't know in English, but the DOP or uh, the the uh, help me the the, the the some products have uh, some uh, index cer some mm -hmm. certification of excellence, no? EGP, EGP DOP, but is in in Italian. I don't know the, the, the translation uh, okay. in, in, in English. So English. they are worried about the possibility that if they use treated with water, they could not achieve this certification. So Europe, at the European level, okay, we have the new regulation, but we have to combine the new regulation for the treatment also uh, with the regulation that helps the utilizers, because the farmers are the utilizers of treated wastewater, to do it 
without any particular problem yeah. under the safety, under the For risk sure. approach and what we want. If we, we, we will be able to do this, I think that the reuse sector will be speed up very soon in Europe. If we don't do this, I think that the farmer community, mm -hmm. not the, the citizen community, but uh, this is another level, but the farmer community will, uh, will, will be not so easy convinced to use this treated wastewater. But only, not, not because they are really concerned about the safety, because they know that they are often already yes. using wastewater without any control, Oops. but because they are thinking about possible impacts on the, on the certification, on the market, of course. Yeah, hot topic is also the organic uh, certification. Yes, yes. It is a hot topic, but I have to say that we have been working with um, water reuse projects and we have been irrigating uh, tomatoes that were certified eco without any problem. But uh, still there are some questions. Um, I think we, we have to, I don't know if you want to add something. But oh, I, I agree with what uh, Attilio said uh, and I am uh, really happy to see that there are uh, arising uh, projects, examples in which uh, the governance bodies are involved directly as partners. Uh, we have seen one today, Menco, and uh, uh, I have, uh, you know, I have run into another one, which is Menawara, which is Italy is involved with ENI, and it is a joint consortium with Spain, Italy, and there is also Jordan and uh, uh, Tunisia, and also Palestine is uh, involved. And I was really happy to see that uh, there is the Ministry of uh, uh, Water and Irrigation and also the Authority of Water from Jordan and Palestinian, which are joining the project and participating to the work packages with regard to this dissemination and uh, intake uh, by uh, the central uh, governance bodies uh, uh, of the outputs. So, mm. Really, we need, I agree completely with uh, what Asilio said. Uh, okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, governance is a pillar of this yeah. Nexus approach. And as uh, Asunu mentioned, this commitment from the public administrations is, is totally needed, otherwise it doesn't work. I also agree with you, Atulio, on the planning. I think um, when we talk about circular economy, we always uh, say that this um, river basin planning is analogous to the eco design. We talk about production and uh, yeah. water management. So I think planning is key as well. So to understand what you need, what you have, and the potentiality uh, for what you use. And I also like to mention that now there are many projects as well, um, some of them uh, in which we are involved, uh, regarding methodologies um, to really assess how this water reuse is contributing to this nexus, this uh, water, energy, food, and ecosystem nexus to, to also provide evidence um, uh, with uh, big pilots and, and full demonstrators as well um, on how implementing this water reuse is contributing to this innovative nexus. And I think, do you want to add something? I, I think that there, there is a, an elephant on the room and just in 30 seconds to add something. <laughs> Uh, we cannot go further in this step of uh, reuse and uh, achieve the Without goals that, that we want if we keep the freshwater costs at the level that, at least in Portugal, we have. A cubic, meet, a cubic meter of fresh water <laughs> in <them>. Portugal <laughs> costs for the farmers around 5 cents. We as operators to, 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 to produce uh, reused wastewater, we cannot produce at least in the most, most part of the case, at five cents per cubic meter. Yeah. So, uh, until we solve this problem, until we solve this problem of sell one of the uh, most important res resources for the country development, this like this, we cannot go further on the reuse. So, sorry for the interruption. No, no, but, it's I, true. This but, but this is not thirty uh, seconds I thing. Completely <laughs> agree. <laughs> <laughs> Just. <laughs> Yeah, I think we all agree. Yeah. In my case, we have a company and we sell treatment plants and we cannot compete 
with there is an unfair advantage <laughs> from those paying very low uh, for for the water from conventional sources. We we have we have no possibility to compete with them if we provide technologies or we provide system conventional or non conventional. And this is something could that I, uh, could I say a, a word? <laughs> yeah, Carmen, yes, you Carmen are, is you going are, to you kill are me. totally true. <laughs> but we have. Uh, a, a new scenario, climate change. In some areas, yes. uh, there are yeah. farmers without water for in some years without water. So with with food production completely gone. Yeah. So, so in this term, so climate to change is good to for have, us. <laughs> to have to, to have uh, an amount of water constantly present, regardless the climate for farmers. Could could uh, could be the difference. Yes, so I'm this sure. is the part that overcome the problem yeah. of, of of the cost. That that is the real problem. I I, I fully yeah. agree with you. Yeah, yeah. I think also it's important that we understand that the water treatment has to be very well done to move also to water reuse. And in some cases, uh, and I have actual examples in Spain, we have. Uh, regions in which um, everything has been planified very well and then you have fully uh, operating and good operating wastewater treatment plants that can deliver an effluent that is easy to, to, make, to reclaim. But on the other, it's not that. So this is also something that we have to take into account. I don't think we have much time. I don't know if we have time for any question from the public. One question. Huh? Yeah, please. <laughs> Um, I don't know if any of you want to. Uh, maybe it's better. Uh, we cannot hear. So if we could you repeat, please. I can try. Yeah. I was hearing you now, and I was thinking, if the governance, global governance or European governance, was to change the uh, current subsidies from fossil fuels to help the farmers buy the water that is now treated to pay for this difference in price, would that be a solution? Well, <laughs> I mean, that would support it. I don't know. Maybe well, you, you can say something. Let me put the question if I can answer in another way. Um, at least in Portugal, and I imagine that in other countries it's the same. Uh, when you buy, as a farmer, a cubic meter of water by five cents, you are putting uh, public money on, on that. You are subsidizing that kind of, uh, of uh, yeah, water because you have to build the dam, you have to manage the dam, you have to keep it safe and so on and so on. You have to spend the energy to put the water on the farmer's land. So in the most part of the countries we are, as all of us as citizens, we are paying for our uh, agriculture. So if you don't pay that, if you pay the fresh water by the correct price, probably the difference is not so big. In Portugal, we can reuse uh, wastewater by uh, with a tariff with uh, 20, 25 cents per cubic meter. Okay. So um, maybe I, uh, I'm not apologist of, of uh, subsidizing activities. Uh, so my point of view is to take the subsidized from 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 the fresh water. Anything to add? No, I I, I fully agree. Agriculture in our countries as uh, also a social aspect. Yeah. So we subsidize the agriculture yeah. because agriculture for sure is uh, the, the main producer of food. So it's, it's, it's crucial for us. So in terms of water, I agree with you, it's totally subsidized by, by, by us because uh, the, the cost of water is not uh, is, is not rare, it's not comparable with, uh, no. with, with, with potable water. And, uh, but uh, I, I think that also the water in some areas spread by, uh, for irrigation, for agriculture, uh, helps and change also the ecosystems. So we have to also uh, see, but it's a, a very long history, mm. yeah. that also the, the, the ecosystem benefit of the agriculture. W what would help in a hectares 
of irrigated land, we stop the, the irrigation. Well, in some cases they are contributing, in other cases they are not contributing. So but I, 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 it's, I a, think it's a difficult yeah. matter. I, I Maybe think we, there yeah. could be <laughs> just uh, 30 seconds. Maybe there could be incentives uh, to the usage of the already existing uh, treated water, starting from uh, selective uh, crops uh, or selective uh, territories, and see how the reaction is, uh, but keeping in mind that we have at the same time to protect uh, this uh, European uh, uh, certified labels of quality for the food, uh, EGP, DOP, territorial excellencies. This has to be guaranteed. And uh, we have also to, uh, actually it is an open uh, uh, field of uh, discussion, we have also to guarantee that the quality of the water is the suitable one for the specific crop, because we know that some crops have a quality because the water have some specific uh, minerals, uh, ions inside. Yeah, so all one. these things have to be considered, but definitely maybe that's some incentives. Uh, maybe during the summertime, uh, when uh, all of us are suffering from uh, the lack of water. So I think that we just need to be some uh, innovative and some, you know, we need to be challenging and risk a bit. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so I thank you all very much for being thank here you. with thank me you. today. Thank you. And I thank you also to, to you for your attention. And I think uh, I will give the word to, to Rui to uh, yeah, close the, the event for today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for another uh, very interesting debate on where we stand right now and where we can go from here. Um, I would like to thank everyone that followed us here in Lisbon, but also online, and took part in the second Water Reuse Day as part of the event Rethinking Water. We will be, we will be really glad to hear from you and please stay in touch with the project. Um, this has been a very, as I can see in at least in the people here, I can see in your faces, it has been a very intense uh, day. So um, we focused on innovation, we focused on policy and cross-sectoral um, initiatives that can contribute to tackle water scarcity. I would like to thank all speakers that were present here uh, that took part in today's sessions, as well as to all the EIT water scarcity and feed for reuse project partners that have been very involved in the organization of this event. Now it is time to rest. Um, and enjoy the evening. But before we do so, I would like to go through a quick overview of what's waiting for us tomorrow. We will start at 9.30 local time, so Lisbon time, um, with an award ceremony where the award-winning solution providers from this edition will be presenting their product and service offering. Um, after that, we will have a complete program focusing on the importance of collaboration between um, stakeholders, educational initiatives and funding opportunities for the scaling up, uh, for scaling up the business, sorry, among others. So you cannot miss this as well tomorrow. I wish you all a good evening and I hope you join us tomorrow from 9.30 local time. For those here with us at Museu do Orient, uh, we are having a networking cocktail upstairs on the fifth floor, the same place we went for the coffee break. So I'll see you there in a few minutes. Obrigado.